I've been leaving low-hanging fruit on the tree of woe. I wanted to do a tier list of all the CSGO majors, because remember, it's the last CSGO major ever, bro, in, in, in Paris. And uh, I've been working for a long, long time. I've been writing this series called uh, The Majors and Me. And it's basically like where I was, what I was doing while I was like at each of the majors. Because obviously I worked in loads of different capacities and I didn't work every major. In fact, for the early majors, I was explicitly told uh, there would be no need. Uh, CSGO wouldn't be, a, uh, wouldn't be a good fit because <laughs> I'd, I'd been a StarCraft host at that point. And even though I came from Counter-Strike to do StarCraft, for some reason... I couldn't get work in Counter-Strike initially. So anyway, basically, like, I did some events as, like, a journalist, and I did some events, obviously, as an analyst, and I did some events as a host. Then when I went to E-League, I did their events, guaranteed. The best ones, of course. The ones that weren't E-League, I, I sort of couldn't do. They they didn't stop me E-League, to be fair. They just said we'd sort of appreciate it if you didn't, because it does sort of devalue what we're doing because we think you're really good at your job so I was like, all right yeah fine i'll have those ones off so there was like some i missed entirely there was some i watched as a fan essentially like krakow was one obviously 2018 uh london i got completely shafted by face it like a lot of us did which was you know just classic old boys club nonsense i guess because uh you know we'd we'd had to use face it talent at e-league because we had a joint venture so we weren't even allowed to choose commentators or not that's how you end up with like weird things happening like people probably don't remember but for the very first e-league thing we did in the road to vegas i was a analyst and james bardolph was a host that was for the famous Shaq clip, right? James Bardolph's in the clip, but he's the host and I'm the analyst. I'm not actually the guy. I, I had like su a super like weird, you know, kind of journey through all of the majors. And so I wanted to write an art, like a series of articles, the majors and me, because I thought it'd be interesting. And I've been chipping away at it for like ages and ages and ages. And obviously, because like life is just this fucking constant barrage of fucking nonsense. Uh, I haven't finished it. And uh, I'm, I'm just an old man now. I'm just, look at me. I'm just, just old and washed. I'm end stage Ragnar from Vikings. Just going to have to go die some, on a raid in England. But anyway, Thorin did a CSGO majors tier list. Uh, Launders did one as well. And probably a few other content creators have done one. And so I was like, well... I'm pretty sure my community would would like that as a piece of content. So I did I did start setting it up. So I guess that's what we're going to do. I don't know how long this is going to take. I, and I want to say as well, like I thought Launder's uh, tier list was not great. I didn't really agree with a lot of it. But I mean, obviously, again, perspective on this is kind of interesting because the ones that I worked as a journalist are the ones that are just a gap in my memory because... When you're a journalist at an esports event, just like everything else in fucking esports, it's not like, oh, you're a journalist, so you go to the event, you enjoy the event, and then you go home and you write one article about your your time at the event, right? That's what would happen normally. But in esports, what that means is you go to the event and you are on under massive pressure to churn out approximately eight video interviews a day, all the match reports, and probably like a couple of featurettes a day as well. Like just, you know, 1500 word article here and there. And if you can't manage that, fuck you. It's one of the reasons why I'm so utterly burnt out with like written content. And I only have like these sort of flashes of, you know, what I consider, but I think I wasted my best writing years on writing absolute fucking garbage, you know, like uh, um, garbage that exists on websites that don't even exist anymore it's gone my best work isn't even on the internet <laughs> so those events were so time crunch heavy and so intense the work i was typically on about four hours sleep a night for about you know four consecutive nights and you have to keep producing content it just it just diminishes you. It just takes something out of you. Those events where I was a journalist, I don't really remember so much because you don't get to watch a lot of the games. I mean, the ridiculous thing about a lot of those majors, like Cologne was one of them, for example, 
I had to come back from the major and then watch the VODs of the major I was just at to get any sort of concept about who played well and what happened and all that stuff. So, yeah, it's um, it's kind of weird because, as I said, I, I did a lot of these. There was some news recently, like, uh, as well, you know, I think about, you know, all how, how I had a career in broadcasting. And uh, Gfinity said they're going to be moving on from esports. And obviously Gfinity was a big part of why I was able to sort of end up in an analyst role, you know, the Gfinity's Angels, which was me, Thorin, and Scoots. And obviously, you know, we uh, we don't work uh, together anymore, you know. I mean, well, Duncan and I sort of do through the last Free Nation guest appearances I do. But um, obviously Scoots doesn't talk to me anymore or, or Duncan anymore. But that was like a super uh, important kind of part of like the development of just CS broadcasting tone what we were going to do uh, and having that carte blanche and obviously we were doing by the numbers as well you know sort of creating that more like banter style as Duncan calls it and so you know sad to see them kind of go out of business because I, I don't think I would have ever got on TV if I hadn't have been able to showcase my particular talents you know whatever they might be in a broadcast setting so uh let's do it i'm gonna i'm gonna do my tier list there's a there's a preamble uh it's, it's a tier list with a caveat i'm gonna do them in chronological order i don't think that was how launders did his i mean shit man these what, what the fuck are these logos even can't even tell what they are at, at, at this at this resolution uh so uh dream out winter 2013 was obviously the first major it came like off the back of We'd had that, uh, you know, arms arms dealer update, and uh, obviously skins had just come in. But up until that point, CS:GO was pretty fucking dog shit as an esport. It was really, really bad. And a lot of people bring this up. I'd already fucking tweeted. I think that is because the game was so disappointing in its development. So for those who don't know, when the game first came out, there was a beta. I was uh, instrumental in d distributing that beta. I was sending out all the keys to players, to everyone. It's funny, I, I still get DMs now. Uh, well, still, when I'm going through DMs, like people message me, you, I can see where I've given people like beta keys. Like, you know, I, I sent out, I basically did all of Heaven Media's beta key distribution manually. And we even did some live events where like we gave out the beta keys. I remember there was one event where we were throwing out beta activation cards, beta mail activation cards into the crowd. And it, and the, some of them gone on the floor. And a kid fucking, like, went to reach out for one, and some dude, like, stamped on his wrist. <laughs> just fucking just, just crunched him. Because uh, everyone was so desperate to get those fucking codes so they could get the game there was so much excitement because counter-strike source had been a disappointment to the 1.6 community and they always hated the fact that css kind of like existed at all and in the end got chose for like tv with cgs and stuff there was like a lot of bitterness because at the end of 1.6 it was really being held up by that arbalet dude that funded navi and in, in in the very early days of the org before it was even called navi so you know they they were all like fuck we're never going to play counter to strike source we're never going to play source anyone who plays source is shit at the game and then all of a sudden you know 1.6 is dying source is dying there's a new game coming out and you know initially all the 1.6 dickheads and hltv were like well we're not going to touch that game but 1.6 was fucking dead so it's 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 that or nothing guys and so for the first time we essentially had like a unifying game for both scenes which is what i, I remember getting that i think one of the first times i ever had a really bad time in esports in terms of like threats and not being able to go to events uh, one of the one of the first times was I wrote an article that basically said the 1.6 community needs to grow up and stop stop like lionizing an old game that looks terrible and can never be on television uh, just because you, you you live in a country where you can't afford a fucking good PC right that was the that was pretty much it I was like listen. I'm sorry if you don't have the economic spending power to buy a PC that can run a game, but that shouldn't inform what we use as an eSport. And so I did that. I wrote that article, and basically, like, there was, like, a, an account, I think it was called, like, 1.6 Police, 
over on HLTV. They would post about me all the time. They post blogs about me all the time. There was all the 1.6 community fucking basically telling me, like, listen, if we see you, we're going to kill you. You've tried to kill our game. The game's all I have, you know, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, eventually we got CSGO. Everyone sort of came to it. Hit, remember, it was outsourced to Hidden Path initially. And Valve uh, let Hidden Path basically do the bare bones of the game. And then Valve sort of said they were going to bring it in in-house, uh, which they later did. But during the development of the game, there was these forums. And they said, look, we're going to talk to the pros. We're going to talk to... You know, all the people we've we want to come and influence the game, uh, and you can help steer the development. And that lasted for a few weeks, and then it sort of went dead. No one was using the forums. No one was responding to it, and so the game just wasn't great. It didn't feel as good as one point six. And honestly, for years, CS:GO was an inferior game to CSS. Obviously, I'm talking about CSS with Z-Block, but uh, CSGO was actually in bad fucking shape, and that was true in 2013. And I'd famously said, I think it's time to accept CSGO isn't going to be the game we all hope it is. This is the tweet. It's probably still up. You can find it. Uh, it's fair. It's safe to say that CSGO isn't going to be the, uh, the, the game we all want it to be. I'm going to channel my energy into covering other esports titles. Uh, like League of Legends and that was when I went over to League of Legends and basically sort of changed the game in terms of how journalism was done over there because it was just interviews basically it was the only content you had in League of Legends esports until me and the Wonder Kids basically came along and created Roster Mania over there and, and, and started writing opinion pieces and stuff like this. So 2013 comes, I've already put it in D, but it might not be a D tier event. So 2013 comes, there's lots of excitement about the tournament. And so people were wondering how big could the game get. There had already been these like smaller, uh, oh, is it top left? Sorry, is that the wrong dream hack? Is that dream hack? So there'd already been like a, a lot of like rivalries being built because the big thing coming into 2013 was who was going to be better, Very Games or NIP. And so Very Games were the all-conquering team from Source. Like, the last four years, Counter-Strike Source were just dominated by French lineups. All, almost all of them Very Games. And Ninjas in Pajamas had been the early uptakers who'd come in with, obviously, you know, two legendary... Well, two legendary 1.6s and a very, very good and experienced 1.6er. And two players from Source that were actually super high you know, value and, and underrated because Fifth Larum was a franchise player in CGS, for those who don't know. It's probably hard for people to think about Fifth Larum as a star player, but in Source, he was considered, you know, one of the best Swedes for a long time. And so there was a lot of attention, a lot of back and forth with the rivalries, but the tournaments were super small. And we went into this one, and this is it, you know, like big prize pool, People are buying skins. People are tuning into the game. People are going to watch. And I have to say, it was weird because the sense of occasion for the event didn't quite live up to what DreamHack are. And DreamHack, you know, this was a quarter. This is like huge. This is like 2013, quarter of a million dollars, right? In, in 2013 is still mega money, right? And not like now, but like back then, that's fucking insane. And Dream Hacker, the tournament organizers that do it like the alternate style, you know, we fucking chill. Like, I mean, you know, people could people were fucking all over the place with this one. Like, so Dream Hack told everybody, you know, for example, like just wear what you want, and this is how we get the famous you know duncan wearing the la lakers jersey thing they were like you know wear what you want just it's it's a dream hack still not a csgo major but some people were like no but it's a major right and there was still a little bit left over from the um like all the original esports dickheads wanted to basically live out like some fucking fantasy like they were doing the super bowl so they were like super buttoned up people used to wear like you know some of these old boomer fucks used to wear like tuxedos and you know black ties to doing these like esports sports event which i never fucked with because i thought like it's not our audience i can appreciate dressing up nice for a world championship or wearing a suit but you know for me like when i see people in suits and ties and stuff i just kind of it kind of i don't know i never really vibed with it i don't want it to be a fucking fashion show i don't want people to be putting 
you know, their need for flamboyance ahead of the broadcast, you know, like some lot, some talent do do that. They insist on wearing, like, you know, they pull out this ridiculous fucking loud suit that just isn't going to go with what anyone else is wearing. And then they make it their thing. And it's like, yeah, I kind of I kind of don't fuck with that as well because you're upstage, you know, you're the talent, you know. But anyway, you had this, like, insane tonal disconnect but for some people. And so, like, you know, I thought it was funny because I saw I saw Sam, let's say that thing about Jackie, uh, where he was like, Jackie, button up your shirt, you know. And to be fair, Jackie is showing a lot of chest, probably a bit more than I, I would, you know, recommend. But uh, anyway, like, you know, uh, Sam said, like, oh, you know, show a bit of respect for the World Championships. And I'm like, we sort of have gone full circle, haven't we? Because the LA Lakers thing was D-Man and Joe Miller calling Thorin a cunt for wearing an LA jersey he was specifically told he could wear. He asked and was told, yeah, wear it. So for me, the broadcast wasn't great. Now, I was working as a journalist at this one, so I didn't really see a lot of the broadcast, but I, I was very close to some of the broadcast. So even though I wasn't watching it on a Twitch stream, I was watching it live. And, you know, I've, I've gone back and watched it since, and I, I think the broadcast kind of sucks. I remember as well, this is where DreamHack fucked Anders. Fucked Anders and Semler. They told him they weren't going to be on the main stage together. And I still to this day do not understand it because Anders and Semler, they were new school back then. And everybody was basically like, you know, everybody loved them. It's not like now where everyone fucking just hates Semler for no reason. But, you know, everybody loved them back then. And basically, they'd been doing every single game they could. You know, if you, if you were up at 4 a.m., as gamers often are, you could turn on a Twitch stream, you could turn on Nip TV or whatever it was, and you would see Anderson Semler commentating some dog shit tier three finish count strike game. And they'd be loving it, man. You know, and everyone was vibing with it. They were actually driving viewership to you know, tier three teams. And so it was kind of sad that DreamHack did that to them because I thought at the end of the day they'd earned they'd earned their stripes with me. And I remember, I mean, I met Anders, I want to say it was 2012 the first time I met Anders, but it could, I might have met him briefly in 2010, Copenhagen Games, I can't remember the exact year, but I remember meeting him, you know, he brought his missus to the event, and we were just basically like hanging out, he was, oh, great to meet you, you know, and I'm, I'm going to be a commentator, I'm, I'm going to really go all in on CSGO and stuff, and I was like, yeah, that's fucking great, man, like, I'm, you'll kill it. And so, obviously, he hooked up with Semler, that was like, you know, a, a good studio refugee he'd been cast out you know in the oblivion because he used to do bloodline champions and then he went and he was doing daughter and stuff in the good studio and then after that you know he, he ended up in cs go so they kind of found each other and so anyway they should have been on the main stage uh, it's always been a gripe of mine i think it sort of reduces it a little bit i also think some of the broadcast talent in general just wasn't that good i mean this is a hard thing to say out loud because it upsets people but you know i know i like i know cory uh, uh i've worked with um uh, cory dunn and i don't think he's like bad uh but he just never quite did it for me a lot of people really seem to like his casting and i just didn't vibe with it he went into production and so you had Corey Dunn. Obviously, you had Tosspot there. Tosspot is like one of the greats in commentary. That goes without saying. But it was like Lurpis was a commentator. And again, nothing against Tommy. I think Tommy's great as like an analytical mind, an analytical thinker. Dry as a commentator, though, isn't he? And they were swapping pairings around. So the whole broadcast is kind of like ass, really. Obviously, as well, BSL, the, you know, legendary... Uh, Norwegian 1.6 player. BSL was the host, the main... Well, I think he was... Yeah, him and Scoots were alternating as host. And BSL hadn't really done that before. He was super nervous. You could see he was nervous. And BSL's like a journalist. He's like a fully qualified journalist in, you know, in Norway. And uh, he fucking basically, like, I don't know. He, was, he didn't do a great job. Like, that's just real talk. I, lo I, love, I love Jonas, by the way. He's fucking wicked. Uh, very good. Uh, very good guy. But uh, anyway, so the broadcast was kind of, yeah. And then the storylines coming in, the, the, like, the, the more interesting aspects to it was, like, were Nip going to get the major? Obviously, this was the first major. Nip had been this dominant force. The 87 and 0 has gone by this point, but, you know, they are the fucking legends. They were the favourites coming into the tournament. 
and lots of people thought it was a foregone conclusion, particularly when they beat very games in the semi-final in a best of three. That was basically... People always talk about that series like it's epic, but it's actually not even a good series. It should have been a good series because it's like these two teams who've already had a fierce rivalry prior to this major, but it's actually a shit series because it's like a one close map and two stomps. And it's like, it's not... It's not a good series at all. What was more interesting for me at this tournament was the run Complexity had. Because Complexity, when they made it to the playoffs and then beat Astana Dragons, you know, to get to the semifinals, that was like crazy. Like that Complexity lineup with Semphis and Hiko and Swag and Sean Gares. Like, obviously, this is the fucking proto before we get into the world of like you know i buy power and and all those other na teams that people fondly remember it was that it was sort of like america's got talent you know and for me the complexity story was way more interesting now they got done over by fanatic and you're gonna remember again the fanatic lineup probably a little bit differently because this was the fanatic that yeah it had jw and flusher but it all and, and pronax but it had schneider and devil walk those are the guys that go on to win this major they beat nip one of the things i'll always remember distinctly was after nip lost the final nip had had this documentary crew following following them around and it was basically like this early classic like esports content because nip were the big guys and um basically when nip lost the final the camera crew were just all up in their face trying to capture the emotion and i remember freiberg just fucking pushing the cameraman like just get the fuck away from me what actually ruined the i'm convinced the reason that Nip lost this tournament was that documentary crew. Because what a lot, another story people don't know, I don't know if anyone's ever told this story, was apparently on, I don't know if it was the semi finals or the day of the final, but the, cam, the camera crew had them get up early so they could shoot a bunch of extra content. And they would do. They were saying, "Oh, we need like scenes. Could you like go to this hot dog stand and like buy one of the famous like you know Swedish francs and all this stuff?" And they had them like doing all this fucking like additional pickup content for the documentary. And I'm convinced if the documentary crew wasn't there and wasn't following them around, wasn't making them do this content and making them get out of bed and not be relaxed and adding all this tension. And oh, by the way, I was around that crew and they were like, cause I, I talked to some of them, you know. And they were like saying stuff like, and obviously when they win, I mean, like the documentary crew, they'd constructed the entire story as if they'd already won the tournament. And so obviously you're around that, you're doing all of this pickup shit, you, you know, you, you're on camera all the time doing these speeches, there's no quiet moments. And obviously when they went on to lose and they were super frustrated, you know, that, spilled, that did spill over. So anyway, where do I rate this tournament? Uh, for me, it wasn't very good. Uh, it's like not aged particularly well. Obviously, as you'd expect, the Counter-Strike isn't particularly great. It's more of an interesting curio in, in terms of the history. It's the first one. It's not the worst one, uh, but it's a solid C tier, uh, as I recall it. That's a C tier for me. Next up, Katowice 2014. Now, Katowice 2014, this one, I was I was a journalist again. I didn't work this as in a broadcast capacity. And it was like an event where I was like, you know, uh, okay, the scene's trundling along pretty nicely. And by now, things had sort of, uh, we'd, we'd started moving towards, people were taking the scene more seriously. Like back in 2013, the salary some of those players were making were terrible i think complexity weren't on a salary if i remember or it was a very small one that's why they had the big argument over the sticker money there were still people in 2013 that weren't salaried going to these events and the average salary for the average team about 400 euros a month like no joke there were players on 400 euros a month meanwhile uh the nip guys were making a thousand 1200 euros a month right you fast forward to like 2014 and then suddenly people are stepping it up people are taking it serious first pro we got the polls uh they're over you've got obviously you know narvi they put together like a, a great team you know starrick zeus edward 
uh, Guardians on there as well. You got the Hellraiser guys, which was the Astana Dragons kind of runoff. The French show, uh, well bedded in in LDLC. Uh, and everything is like, you know, great, right? Everything's like really, really good. Now, obviously, personally for me, this event is always going to be a super weird event right so before we went out there there was like an episode of unfiltered unfiltered basically was like this you know podcast or like Chan man destiny me and um duncan had gone on there in comments that are always like ridiculously misrepresented you know he was asked kind of like you know his thoughts on poland and duncan basically said that he didn't like poland very much the reason he didn't like poland uh, other than its over-industrialized architecture, was that, you know, he didn't think it was a very progressive country. Particularly, he said, you know, he watches football, and you see all the time when Polish teams play in Europe, or even in their own league, Polish fans racially abuse black players. Uh, there was a documentary that had just happened on, like, the BBC. I think it was, like, a panorama. And so it was very topical in, like, if you were British and you saw that, it was very topical. And also, as well, you know, we had the European... There was a, a bunch of countries that were getting freedom of movement around the EU, Poland and Bulgaria, uh, most notably. And so, you know, there was this sort of, like meme in britain about you know a lot of, an influx of polish people coming over and i think duncan like made a joke where he said you know poland's so great why why did they leave and anyway that basically got interpreted as racism which i which always blew my mind because the biggest complaint duncan appeared to have was that poland was a racist country and one of the things he said was he said Katowice is like a terrible city. It's not even Poland's best city. Like he said, to have an esports event, and then he likened it to when you know we have an we have the Olympics in like say an African nation, and we build up all this infrastructure, and then we leave, and that country can't sustain the infrastructure, and it goes back to having economic struggles internally, and the rest of the world just moves on. And it's like that he specifically said that's what esports is doing to Poland. Now, what was also super interesting was the Polish fans literally did this. So stop me if you can spot the disconnect here. The Polish fans who were angry at Thorin were going, Poland's not a racist country, and how dare you compare us to Africa? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know, guys. This, this drama feels really fucking stupid like and by the way that is unironically what was being said so anyway i didn't think much of it at the time duncan was an edgelord it's 2014 it's also early it's still early internet 2014 we're really starting to lay the foundations for like what goes on to become cancel culture and all this other bullshit but it's not a big deal it's not a big deal to be an edgelord still in 2014 2010 everyone was an edgelord it's why by the way when you see people getting got for old tweets you will notice it's all 2010 it's all 2012 why because the zeitgeist was like south park south park were doing entire episodes about like no no words and how silly it all was and people were moving away from the idea of like slurs having this like ridiculous hold that was the zeitgeist that the time now we've now we've had a backslide and now we're even inventing new slurs to be offended by right so like that's just where we're at culturally and, and so you know what started happening was we were we were we were basically holding 2010 2012 sensibilities accountable by 2020 standards right so a lot changed in 2014 was kind of that early onset of cancel culture and, and duncan was an industry iconoclast by this point we'd certainly had our clashes back in the day obviously by this point with friends and colleagues and co-workers but a little remembered fact is i'm the guy who basically fucked over duncan on this right so he said the thing it was the day before got on the plane gets there gets told by red eye so i'm i'm there i'm a journalist i see red, i see red eye pull duncan to one side and basically tell him you can't be on the show the somebody's played the clip of what you said about poland to all the polish crew <laughs> they're fucking furious uh so you can't you, you you're not you're not going to be on the show and so anyway like i got wind of that and i was like well that's a that's a news story and i was like one of the and i was the first guy to report it and what I did, because what I didn't think would happen was, I didn't think people would just 
divorce words from context. I didn't think that would be a thing, but it, it was a thing. So I wrote down it. I wrote down what he said. <laughs> I wrote down what he said verbatim. And on paper, it looks bad because people aren't like laughing and joking. It's like, it's like if you transcribed like an old Anthony and Opie episode, it would, it would look like a fucking Hitler speech, right? But obviously within the context of comedy and all that, you know, it, it loses its sting. So basically, I like reported it and I, and I did the quotes and that made it worse. That made it so much more worse for Duncan that did. Because if I just hadn't, you know, if I just hadn't reported it or reported it in the way I reported it, it would have probably gone a lot smoother. People started taking those quotes and saying he was a racist and a bigot and he xenophobe and all of this stuff. And it just like wasn't what was intended by what he said and because it was now in a written format and other websites started rewriting the news i'd written and it was drama so all the fans flocked to it basically duncan was fucked i mean suddenly he was getting death threats and serious death threats and so he had to spend all of that event just in his hotel room and hoping nobody like saw him because that was the famous, you know, we're going to get you, you know, city of the machete. But also, I mean, like, he showed me, because I went to visit him on the last night, and I was like, sorry, mate, I've kind of fucked you here, like. And he was like, yeah, well, it's one of those things, isn't it? <laughs> we had a drink. Basically, he showed me some of the messages he was getting, and, like, there was, like, dudes saying, I'm going to, me and my boys are going to find you, and we're going to rape you. It was like, it was like F fucks, <laughs> this is insane. This is crazy, because you said Polish football fans are racist, basically. So, anyway, that uh, that one was, like, that event was, like, for me, totally overshadowed by that drama. But there were some nice little moments that I recall. Like, for example, you know, I used to be pretty pally with Taz back way back when. Always had time for him, you know, him, him Neo, and, and uh, him, Neo, and Pasha. I always used to hang out with back in the day if they were out drinking or whatever. We've always had a good rapport. And so when the when the trophy got brought in it, by ESL, this was like before the tournament had even started, it just so happened that like Taz was there and he went over to the trophy and like was like picking it up and looking at it, right, and put it down. And he just looked at me and said, that's mine. I'm a hundred. I'm, like I'm gonna win, and of course they did. They did win the whole tournament. What was very interesting was as well, like in the build up to that tournament, when I was hanging out with players, all the players were like saying to me, like fucking hell, we've been scrimming against Virtus Pro. They are insane. Like they are definite favourites here, and I'm going, come on, scrims don't mean shit. This is probably the one time the scrim factor actually was correct. Uh, and Virtus Pro were on some other shit at this tournament. And it was great to see. And I always liked them. I always liked the guys at Virtus Pro. People probably don't know the story. I used to have a friend called Jehan. I haven't talked to him in a long, long time. Cool kid. They got fucked over by an org. They ended up at an org called Vitriolic. Vitriolic was a South African organization. Turned out, the guy, my, my friend Jehan was their manager, you know. And it turned out that Vitriolic were fucking terrible. Uh, a terrible org that just didn't really have any money they lied about their sponsors lied about their income and so obviously it all came tumbling down and uh, that was why every time they get fucked over by an org and they didn't have an org i think the first one that might have fucked them over was like universal soldiers or something but anyway they used to use the tag again because we've been fucked over again like they won that i want to say they won a wcg uh, after the vitriolic stuff under the tag again so I'm, I'm i knew those guys a long long time and honestly taz is bombastic neo is one of the fucking nicest guys and most humble guys considering he's like a hall of famer legend i introduced him to a friend at one event and i said this is like the best 1.6 counter-strike player of all time and he looked at me like and just said no don't do that don't ever don't say that like he just wouldn't even have it he was like he was mortified that anybody would say that about him in public uh just a super super nice guy uh for for a, for a legend so anyway i was always rooting for these guys it was always a bit of a vp stan back when i cared about this wretched scene 
And so this this tournament, there's like a distinct increase in quality of teams. Obviously, you've got the I by Power lineup that came over. This is the I by Power lineup, by the way, that wasn't salary. They weren't salary. They were just told they could keep the sticker money, which, as we know, <laughs> in 2015, might have had some sort of impact on some of the decisions they made. Uh, so there's a notable increase in, in, in quality of the teams. Uh, you had as well uh, the guy I always used to rave about, but nobody remembers him. Uh, Hearts was at this tournament. Uh, he was like a 1.6 French IGL. And Hearts was the guy that, w without Hearts, there's no existence. Hearts was like a 1.6 in-game leader who was like one of the first real methodical you know, taking notes to events, giving everyone, like, separate sheets, separate game plans. He was the gobby style who would watch, like, so many fucking hours of demos, and he would find, like, new smokes, new flashes, and all this stuff. And anyway, he was with Clan Mystic, which was, like, the Kenny S. Keo lineup. I was, like, super interested to see what he was going to do, because he was, like, fucking, you know, he was, like, god tier. Basically, KRL, who you would probably know as a French streamer now, like, a French insider, but KRL in Source was, like, a legendary in-game leader, one of the best. And he was the original. Uh, there was, like, Regnum, and then there was him. And he basically, I've told the story before, him and RPK went away, because they were, like, they were like really good friends when very games was the dominant team and they fucked over krl and kicked him out krl basically said like to rpk come on me we're gonna make a team and we'll beat very games and he went and he created nameless and they end up playing in the final of a tournament and nameless won. and there's like a whole video around it and everything else it's like super cool but anyway krl learned the game from hearts and existence basically wanted to outdo krl and so all the stuff that krl used to do that existence took you know in the same way like you know if you don't have you, you don't have carrigan uh if you have uh, if you don't have god b you don't have uh, existence if you don't have hearts so anyway there was like there was like some super cool shit going on in this tournament if you were like an aficionado like me but obviously what about the games what about today dickhead it had like a pretty dull bracket i want to say like the dignitas nip semi-final is like one of the most one-sided games that's sort of ever been played at a major probably it's like really embarrassing the Virtus pro lgb game is like low-key one of the fucking best that's ever been played probably one of the best like as a series it was super cool because uh, lgb nearly battled their way back into it but Virtus pro were just like too fucking good there was like an overtime win in there and lgb was of course they were like the proto swede lineup right with crims and olaf in there so yeah this is like a, this is actually a good tournament i i, I liked 2014 a lot cool story with Virtus pro final wasn't great but overall i think i think this is like a it's is it an a kind of 2014 i think it might be i think it is i'm all right with that I, i'm happy with a so next up obviously we have cologne 2014 now cologne 2014 is uh uh regarded by many as one of the one of the classics it was kind of like an event that really set up the whole idea of cologne as the cathedral of counter-strike and this tournament i i was but i was still in the trenches as a journalist for this one as well i think no no i worked this one yeah right sorry so this is like a strange time in my life right so there was a gfinity event the weekend before this and so th this is a bit of a bum a bummer a bit of a sad story but like i don't know just just bear with me i want to tell the whole thing because this is like gonna all be in the article so it's good practice i get asked like three four weeks before the major by red eye do you want to come and do the event and i was like in what capacity and they said you're going to be an analyst and i was like oh who else is going to work uh, the as an analyst with me and they and they said oh we've got like we're going to just have a ton of players on and it's you're going to be the main analyst so all the people who were like richard lewis knows nothing about counter-strike richard lewis no yeah he's a fucking idiot uh i was uh, at, at 2014 i am the main analyst i am the dude i'm the anchor on the desk now <laughs> 
this so this event the reason it's sort of all jumbled up in my memory was so on like a wednesday or a thursday i think it was my friend who lived in port talbot in a, a place called sandfields which if you're from there you know there was a fire at his house and his mother was um burnt to death in that fire and the fire she was upstairs asleep she's taken some sleeping pills gone to sleep and then a fire had broke out and she she burnt to death in, and and the, the fucked up thing was i'd lived in that house right I'd, I'd spent some time when i was like couch surfing between jobs and so I, I i knew leslie she was a lovely woman and so anyway she burnt but it was like it was like that fucking scene from snatch my mate gareth turned up as the fire was raging and the fire brigade was there i think someone had called him and he was trying to get in the house and they wouldn't let him and obviously his mother passed away and he saw he saw his mother uh, uh die so i get the call and he tells me what's happened all of his friends are like you know you gotta get down here i'm like i will i will i've got these two esports events though i'm pre-booked and then i'll come down and i'll sort everything out so i go to gfinity and we do the event, whatever whatever that Gfinity event was. And then on the Sunday, I get a phone call from one of my mates saying, Gareth, whose mother had died in the fires, hung himself. He couldn't handle it, and he, he hung himself. Obviously, I, I lived with Gareth. We were, like, we were, like, super close friends at university and everything else. So, you know, and I'm just thinking, I should have been there, you know, I should have gone down, should have done something, fuck esports, what am I doing, it's a Gfinity, you know, blah, blah. But esports is this, like, super weird, like, fucked up, insidious lifestyle where if you say no to one person once, you might never get asked again. And so a lot of the talent that you like is carrying that at the back of their mind, knowing that if they turn down an event, they might never work again. And this is how you end up on this endless grind of being on the road. So anyway, I have to go to the funeral. He was a big Ultimate Warrior fan. We did this Ultimate Warrior. He was a, he used to play bowls as well, because in Port all, but that's all there is to do. And we did this big Ultimate Warrior-themed funeral with the tassels on the coffin. I carried his coffin down to uh, uh, the bowls green. Uh, we rolled the bowl down the bowls green for him. You know, we uh, gave a speech. We all had a drink. We had a jolly up. We went to the Four Winds. In, uh, no, we went to the Working Men's Club first and we did like uh, in port albert and we had like a thing for him we had a video of him where he'd sung karaoke so he always said when he died it'd be funny if he we could find a way to have him sing karaoke at his own funeral so we did that and so anyway it was a real fucking heavy time it was a heavy time my missus at the time was a pain in the ass about it she was one of them women who was like you got to pull yourself together <laughs> like it had been a week you got to pull yourself together and she was going and i don't think going to an esports event is gonna help and i'm like yeah because sitting around the house listening to you telling me to get a grip is fucking that's therapy so anyway i got all this you know bad voodoo in my head and i get down i i, I, I tell her i have to go to cologne it's a fucking major i have to go so i get down there um i'm immediately like I'm, I'm very withdrawn i didn't like hang out with anyone at this event machine was there not because he worked the major but he was doing another esports event it might have been call of duty or he was doing something so and alex was in the same hotel as me alex was like pretty much the only guy i saw alex and pansy i think pretty much were the only two people i hung out with at this event i was like a fucking ghost they were like i knew them from the old times so you know and you know, I could talk to those those guys. So anyway, we'll get to the event itself. And it's at a fucking Gamescom or whatever it's called. And I'm thinking it's gonna it's ESL, it's a major, it's gonna be sick. And it wasn't. It, it was they basically had a fucking curtain around about two hundred fold out chairs with a really small stage, the kind you might do a fucking school nativity on, and the desk that we worked on was a fucking table, which was barely big enough for two people with a computer on it, with whoever was doing the hosting next to us, 
and then Valve over there. So it there was just three tables in a row. Valve are watching everything. We got the host here. When the host cuts to the host, it was just it was just here. It was just us. And I'm the only analyst, so I'm doing almost every game. And like I say, my head my head is fucked. But just show must go on. Consummate professional, deep breaths, you know. I, I fucked myself on on one uh, on one of the broadcasts. I realised I was wearing the jacket I wore at the funeral, and it still had you know the in in memoriam fucking slip in it. And I saw that one day when I was on air. And I was just like barely with it, you know, I just couldn't really focus. <clears throat> so anyway, the event was kind of notable. It was notable for Nip winning <laughs> and it was notable for Nip winning because of the fucking randometer. Because this was basically the event where they put in that old version of Cobblestone, which was fucking dog shit. And I think the third maps were all decided at random. <sighs> Uh, they had that random map thing. Basically, you you didn't do a full veto for those for those who who know how it works. You did basically like you picked your map, they picked their map, and then the third was brrr, and basically the only team that had sort of embraced Cobble was Nip, and Cobble just kept coming up for them. Like it's actually ridiculous. Like uh, you know, so let me let me just show you the run in the playoffs. They got Cobblestone as the decider in Cloud Nine. That was the Cloud Nine, by the way. That was like Sean Gares, Sempis, Ego. It was basically the dudes who'd been Complexity plus Shroud. They would have won <laughs> if it had been any other map other than Cobblestone because they batted them on New. They fucking lost sixteen fourteen on Dust Two, but then it was Cobblestone and they lost sixteen fourteen to Nip. So Nip went through. Uh, then in the LDLC one, guess what happens again? It's Inferno, it's Nuke, and then the decider is Cobblestone. And you get to the final, and Nipper like, fucking hell, we keep winning Cobblestone. Let's pick Cobblestone. I think Fnatic had banned out Nuke, and so they, they beat Fnatic on that, and then Fnatic had cash. You had an epic Inferno decider, and Nip got it over the line. And we got the classic get right on his knees, Hugging finally got my major trophy pose. That red eye got himself in because he did he did the cardinal sin of oh, I'll go over and show everyone how I'm friends with Christopher so he could be in the thing. I mean there was there was a lot of weird stuff going on at that event. I mean I'm going to be totally candid in this. It's weird as well because it's just a tier list, but basically this is Richard's memoirs. <laughs> um, is what this is. So uh, yeah, I mean that event was also super weird. There was just some weird fucked up shit going on. This was still tyrant red eye this was the time of tyrant red eye now paul had been really cool to me i told him when i went in about what had happened and he was super nice and supportive which is not paul's forte but the version of red eye that was working this event was crazy i mean i saw some shit behind the scenes i think it was the first time they'd brought in an external producer at esl Paul usually had a lot of input in running the show, and Paul and this guy just did not f fucking vibe at all. And so there was all these arguments and very heated arguments. There was also like um, I can't even remember. There was like this weird moment where a, a, some commentator had to drop, like one of the casters. Casters at this event were like Pansy, Tosspot, Anders, and Semler. And anyway, something had happened, and they they had to switch it up for whatever reason. And Paul went straight away, like going, "Ah, oh, well." I guess I'm going to have to bloody... <laughs> I guess I'm going to have to give the crowd what they bloody want. Uh, I'm going to have to bloody get involved. And so, and I remember distinctly, like, Toss Pot was, like, saying, Pansy's free, you know. You don't, you don't have to do it. Yeah, well, I just thought it would be a nice bonus for everybody because a lot of people have been asking me to cast again and, and Toss Pot's going, yeah, but Pansy has barely casted any of the games she'd really like to have a playoff game you know uh oh, well i don't know it's a bit of a risk isn't it he's going paul for fuck's sake toss and paul uh toss pot and paul knew each other from like quad v they were in a company together and eventually paul like acquiesced and let pansy have a cast he let her have a go you know so anyway it was just all this weird fucked up shit the whole event was a shit show for me i just disappeared on the last night i just went out alone into the streets of cologne had a drink got a kebab and fucking went back to the hotel room and was just sort of pondering on you know what i was gonna do and what kind of nightmare i was gonna get back to uh and it was like it, it, it was one of the most emotionally tough ones that that i worked i it was where i really started to get disenchanted with the community because 2014 like 2015 was a terrible year for me personally i mean everything in my life kind of went wrong but 
2014 was the start. It's like, I've already given, you know, 10 years of my life at this point, you know, like give or take, like nine, eight or whatever, you know. Um, and because I was being told to keep the an analysis light and breezy, because we had no tools on the desk, it was literally, like, my home setup is more <laughs> complicated than what we had to work with. The Twitch chat was up on a monitor, like, over here. And so I'm doing the show. Um, the Twitch chat is there in real time. I don't know why, but it was. And it is just, Richard Lewis doesn't know what he's talking about. Fuck Richard Lewis. Richard Lewis should kill himself. Please kill yourself. Please die. Fuck, I'm telling you, it was the most vitriolic stream of abuse I've ever seen in my life. And I don't even know why. You know, I was there with the players. It was like, you know, you, I'm doing that thing where you're trying to get, like, some of the players don't understand the social cues, you know? And I'm saying, like, the, play, the player, like, oh, and what about this thing they did? Can you explain that? And then the player would go, well, yeah, you just do that. <laughs> and then I'd be like, oh, very brilliant, yeah? Uh, can we can we elaborate? And then, then that was spilling into, Richard's not letting them talk. Fuck Richard Lewis. He should kill himself. So I was just like, for fuck's sake. So I just put up with, like, abuse for all that event the event itself to be there was shit the hotel was shit the vibe among the crew on the few occasions i got involved was shit the games were shit <laughs> cobblestone is shit the concept of a randometer is shit and like the only thing that fucking happened good in this was nip winning basically and even then a lot of people wanted nip not to win <laughs> like you know outside of nip fans there wasn't a lot of love for nip so for me this this major is actually low-key one of the worst like this is this is a major is so fucking stupefyingly bad all round. I got nothing but bad memories of it. I want to say it's a D tier. I think it is a D tier. I'm leaving it in the D tier. It was the worst of colognes. Right, next. Let me go into the thing. Ah, yes. T 2014. Who could forget this one? Boost gate, is it? There's not a lot that hasn't been said about this and the on fire guys did a fucking tremendous documentary uh, about it which you should totally watch so this event like i'm i'm there it's dream Act. i'm always having a good time i always get vip treatment i know the people who create the company i'm not working the event for whatever reason i still don't get into the dream hack csgo events even though like i'm doing all the StarCraft events. So I'm here as a journalist. So I see loads of shit that I'm not meant to see. I think actually, did I? Did I? I might have done some Twitch work at this one. I think I might even have been an interviewer for Twitch. I think I did like. I think I had. A, I can't remember if it was this one, but I think there was a dream hack where I had like. A, I got paid by Twitch to do like interviews on a sofa and the videos are up on my youtube channel you can still find them this event of one of the most analyzed talked about events because of what happened with ldlc fanatic let's just sort of paint a picture of, of coming in to to the event about you know what was going on in the scene you know contextually we changed the format by now of course and you know we were kind of evolving to the csgo you probably know the teams were you know look you got the Virtus Pro boys still, Snacks Bialy on, you know, are, are starting to emerge as talents. You've got the Danes in Dignitas, which is the Zipnix Dupree device core led by Fetish. Thorin just recently did a Reflections with Fetish. If you don't know Fetish, Henrik's a fucking legend. Uh, he was great in Source, one of the best IGLs in that, and had success early in CSGO. Super cool dude. He's the guy who got up at ESWC when the French commentators were cheating so very games would win. He was the guy who said in an in an interview on stage, your commentators cheated. And he said, oh, how the, the interviewer went to him and said, how is it that very games were able to beat you? And he said, well, your commentators cheated. <laughs> that was his answer. It's like just the most chad shit I've ever seen. And, and the interviewer went, no, come on, you don't think that. And he went, yeah, but you did though. So <laughs> It's great. I wish I wish the footage of that still existed because it was like Chad behavior, you know. So he, he was just a guy who never took any shit. He was a legend. The Fnatic team now has merged with LGB. So you've got all off Crims, Pronax, Fusher, JW. This is the core that will go on to, to this is the group that will be the great Fnatic 
Neville walks out, he's moved to coach, so you, you've still got a little bit of continuity. And NIP, post-major, it finally got rid of Fifth Lauren. Fifth Lauren's gone. So uh, they, this is um, a Makalele a Makalele event and uh, his first run in NIP. We get to the playoffs and Man Alive. It's just, you know, Dignitas are out early. Uh, LDLC uh, have really shown an emerging because they came from the challenges that actually, you know, Shocks, Smiths, NBK, they've still got something. Happy, which used to be called something like Mstead or something like that in, in sources there. Kiyoshima's in that team. They are looking like, you know, legit, man. Like, Shocks is on point. He's, like, one of the best riflers in the fucking world right now. Everybody thinks this team can be, like, a fucking sleeper. They're not doing it clean, but the Fnatic game basically subverts history. Because there is a chance that Fnatic beat them clean, right? But what had happened was, and I'm sure you know this bit by now, there had been a video that had been uploaded to YouTube where someone had found this ridiculous boost where you could essentially get into a spot on overpass looking down at the sewer where you could you could see roll the way in a fucking like spawn and everything and you could shoot people but your hitbox wouldn't register they couldn't shoot you back and so what people were doing was buying an auto well what Fnatic specifically were doing and what what had been done in this video is you bought an auto sniper you got boosted up into the fucking unhittable part of the map and then you just took out the dak dak and you just fucking mowed people down that was the game and basically it happened and Fnatic were behind massively you know i think it was 12-3 at the half because that's just how overpass went back then but then Fnatic started pulling out that tactic which fucking drove everybody insane and up in the press room the press room because by the way go back and listen to the cast i think it's like similar and he's like just saying like this is super awkward like this isn't fun no one's enjoying this no one wants to watch this blah 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 it was like ridiculous so Here's what happens, right? The game stops. An emergency admin meeting is called where it is agreed that Fnatic haven't broken any rules. I was there. I heard it. I heard the DreamHack admin teams and, and I think even fucking Hellsborn and, all the, and Grey Khan and all those cunts were there, right? And they basically said it, the result has to stand. Fnatic did nothing wrong. LDLC come up. They are screaming at the admins and saying the only reason is because that's fucking... That is Swedish bias. You're only doing it because it's a Swedish team. And they were going fucking ape shit. By this point, Fnatic had gone outside. They'd been told that they'd won. And they were sat, like, just outside having a post-game smoke. And they were going through and never do this players they were going through their social media and just looking at the tweets at them people telling them to kill themselves you know all the stuff i get on a daily basis basically people telling them to kill themselves people fucking saying they were going to kill them people fucking tell it saying that they were cheats that what they've done is disgusting and it dawns on them because fanatic were laughing about it right this is the other thing that people don't know fanatic after they'd been told they'd won, they went outside, they were smoking, checking social media. But before that, they were laughing about it. They were laughing. They thought it was hilarious. They were going, <laughs> Flusher was there with his little fucking deliverance banjo face. <laughs> they, were, they thought it was great. And then they realized, holy fucking shit. We're going to have to live with this. We are going to be the most reviled, despised team of all time. Now, keep in mind, there were already rumblings that this team was full of cheaters. That was already building up. They couldn't have done a worse fucking thing in to, uh, to go over with the community because LDLC were liked, it is the Shoxy, it is the Smiths, it is the MBK, back when Happy was actually Happy, right? It was a bad team to do it against, and the flippancy with which they did it 
went over poorly with the community and the fact that they were considered to be cheating anyway like imagine it like imagine if you're a pleb fan and you think Fnatic are cheaters and Flush is cheating Flush has got the aim lock right and then they go to an event and it's not even enough that they're aim locking they have to then use a boost that they deliberately covered up Fnatic manager here please delete this they f saw the video got the guy induced the guy to delete the video kept it to themselves didn't tell anyone could have told Val could have had it patched out and then they bust it out in a must win game and then they laugh about it fucking hell i was like i wrote an article it might it might still be around actually there it is it's called uh fanatic only have themselves to blame for boost gate and basically i say yeah they deserved all the hate they got that was just really weird everyone else disagreed with me about this like i fucking said this is cheating, this is bad, and it should never have happened. Now, back to the story. The French are having a cry. They're doing what they do best. They've screamed at the admins, accused them of bias along, uh, bias along national lines, and then they've gone outside, and the manager's saying, we're never going to come to your tournaments again if this is how you're going to treat players. They've gone outside, and then Fnatic have uh, realised the hate that they're going to get for winning. And so Fnatic then decide, <laughs> because, oh, oh, I left out this bit. The two groups of players bumped into each other just as the penny had dropped for Fnatic and they were coming back. And the French guys had been crying, like literal tears, like, right? And so there was a fucking thing. There was like nearly a thing between them. There was nearly a fight. And anyway, so Fnatic come back and they're going, can we can we replay? Can we replay from 12-3 and not uh, use the boost? That was the plan, right? And the admins went, well, we've already given the result, but if both teams agree to it, then okay. We're willing to replay the third map from 12-3 like down. Fnatic were trying to be sporting about it. And then LDLC said, nah, fuck you. <laughs> We're too mentally broken to play Counter-Strike now after what you've done to us. So we're not going to replay. And I'm, I was there. Like, this this happened, right? So Fnatic had to go back and basically say, to avoid the community hate, which they got anyway, we're not, we, we, we forfeit. And DreamHack are like going, what do you mean? And they're going, we're, we're forfeit. We're out of the tournament. Give LDLC our spot and then dreamhack tried to frame it like well after much debate yeah no nah, fuck no they didn't give a fuck as far as they were concerned no rule had been broken they repeatedly said that <laughs> so <laughs> you know but anyway in the end Fnatic basically it's the only time i've ever seen a team race to forfeit because LDLC were going to go back to the fucking... They were, they were done. They were like, we're, we're off. We'll see ya. <laughs> it's been real. <laughs> Fuck you, Sweden. And and they, they ended up racing and basically withdrawing. And then the admins had to go to LDLC, who were fucking shredded, and basically say, you're still in the tournament. <laughs> you're, you're, st you're still playing uh, in, a, in a tournament, basically. So, so, yeah, it was like fucking surreal. It's one of the weirdest things I ever happened. They had to basically go and oh, and this is the other thing I think people forget. Then, because so much had been said, LDLC threatening to pull out a dream hack, calling all the Swedish people assholes, fanatic from he <laughs> to why you make everyone hate us. Cause fucking obviously the French have been tweeting as well and riling up the hate. They did something where it was like, I think it was like Shocks and Flusher shaking hands up publicly or like might have been Shocks and JW. And they were going, we're all friends. Things can get heated in competition, but we're all still mates. And I'm like, there's absolutely no way that if this had gone the way the admins had intended, you would have all still been mates. This would have been a fucking blood feud. So that was great. I loved that, like just being there and sort of <clears throat> the delicious drama, just watching as a journalist, writing it all down, writing it up about it, getting opinion pieces out of it. It was fucking awesome. Uh, but unfortunately, overall, it just sort of kills the vibe of the tournament. You know, you end up again with like a couple of good maps here and there. But realistically... The only other remarkable thing about this event for me was how, because Fnatic was so despised, it wasn't even like, 
it, 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 it was super weird for me. It wasn't even like they ever played to the home crowd. Everybody was so behind Nip. And then when Nip went to the final and LDLC won, because everyone thought Nip might do back-to-back, and they didn't, basically the whole... The whole vibe at the event was just fucked. It was just frazzled. It, like, nobody really get, gave a shit. Nobody cared. In terms of the broadcast, this was, like, a weird one because, obviously, uh, this is, like, when James Duffield comes in and hosts a few events. And, basically, you had Duncan and Scoots, me not being there, and then just four casters. And you look at the number of games and you look at the number of, like, broadcast talent and keep in mind the casters were anders and semler and the other pairing was toss pot and fifth lauren right a forgotten forgotten pairing it was like a really like bare bones production it wasn't a great event in terms of how well it was produced it wasn't a great event in terms of the broadcast quality and oh what for those asking what was james like behind the scenes james is a sweetheart james used to be sam for me, on Trash Talk, the first iteration of Trash Talk, uh, we had a Gareth and we had we had James Duffy. I met James back when James used to go to esports events and do like funny little skits and you know stuff like that. And James was he had a company called Streamgasm, it was a fucking great name. And that was how I met James. And then uh, James was a broadcast talent for a bit. Uh, he got immediately airlifted like he probably did like 12 episodes of trash talk and then just got hired by like always happens to me my people always get taken away because i've got an eye for talent uh but J yeah james ended up like working at twitch in the end but he was like a super super nice guy like he always has been model professional real fun guy to be around really nice temperament very compassionate very caring guy so anyway, it just wasn't a great major, was it? It just wasn't very good. After Boostgate, it's kind of like a meh. I might go B, but I am tempted by C. But we'll keep it B for now, and we'll see if at the end. B for Boostgate. Right, next up, I have realised like the pace on this. We've already done over an hour, and we've only done the first four majors. So The next up, one of my all-time uh, faves. We've got Katowice. 2015 this was a great event like this year 2015 is where shit starts getting good in esports like shit actually there's budget people uh actually taking it seriously the production is good there's a lot of talent being hired you've got like the emergence of the professional observer there was like a weird thing with this one. So let me let me get this right. Katowice is March 2015. This was sort of a weird time for me as well, like for, for different reasons. In January of this year, after six months of work I did through 2014, we had the iBuy Power Ban. Because if you remember, the game that caused the problem was in August 2014. And so this was when we're sort of living with the idea that there's an entire team of top level NA players dropping out, you know, being banned. And it was weird because it's like I say, right? So for the I by power thing, and I, I, I have the I'm a professor now and I have to talk about it on my course. I'm in my I'm in the course material i'm taking myself out because it's a bit too fucking meta to talk about yourself to, to the students you know but anyway the um the the thing with this was i'd spent six months on it and i got really personally invested because people i thought were friends cause remember i knew steel and famously everybody knows i let them stay at my house when a team called mtw mortal teamwork a German organization. Uh, basically, they went bust and kicked him out on the streets after he'd moved to Germany to play there. And I said, come to my house in the UK. I was living in Birmingham at the time. And just stay until, you know, we get your shit together. He, you know, we, he was there a long time. Met my girlfriend. We used to go, you know, we'd go out for dinner and, you know, whatever. And he was he was practicing on a setup in my living room. He, bro he broke a chair. I never got that back, but I guess it's all we're even <laughs> in many ways so he was uh, a cool guy you know but like and, and i knew dazed and you know, you know from css he he was essentially the na gatekeeper and uh i got personally invested in the i by power story because i knew they'd done it but you know also i knew a ton of other players had done it as well i mean i'll never say it because it's all academic now but in 2014 some of your favorite players 
basically everyone was addicted to skins at this moment in time there were players that you would consider really really nice really cool people and yeah they did it they they threw a game here or there for skins they dropped a map for skins you know they were exploiting CS:GO lounge it just it just happened skins really fucked everything up and the creation of CS:GO lounge just turbocharged the nonsense and shenanigans that were going on in in esports and i've talked to players about it i've had players confess <laughs> you know yeah we did and it's like okay well you know whatever and it's just like i said it when we did i buy power the fair thing to do was basically get you know valve should have created a task force and should have worked with me and csgo lounge and we could have got everyone all at once valve didn't want to do that so instead they issue this fucking draconian ban to five people who weren't even the tip of the ice but well not five people but five players four players i keep forgetting skadoodle got away with it you know and it weren't even the tip of the iceberg now this was super weird as well like it was it was like it really set na back massively that team was gonna uh, join evil geniuses this all feeds into the hell in a cell the loader incident that team was gonna join evil geniuses uh with hiko and i was i was telling hiko because you know i was good friends with spencer at the time i was like listen don't get too close to those guys because they 100 percent did throw that match and it's coming down the pipe valve valve retribution is coming my sources are telling me it's coming and he was going look man i don't know they said they didn't do it to me and i'm like going bro they fucking did it it's it's so obvious they did it the evidence is just so concrete that they did it and the i by power guys as well they'd done this like media tour i don't know if it was prompted by i by power the company i don't know what it was but they went on like summit stream summit was like really big at the time particularly he was like you know for cs uh, he's a big, still a big streamer now. He's had wicked longevity, and he's a good, he's a good guy, and there's no ill feeling about this. But he was uh, he was sponsored by I Buy Power at the time, and so the I Buy Power players went on the popular streamer with the I Buy Power stream, and they started saying, "I, I was a frustrated old man." <laughs> they were calling me old back then. I was a frustrated old man, and I was doing it for attention, and I'd made up the whole thing, and Shazam had tricked me because Shazam was a rat, and they were just saying all. All this stuff and obviously because it's summit and he's not an interviewer he's just a streamer and it's also probably been motivated by fucking you know this corporate interest he, he's just not pushing back on any of that at all <laughs> and so i had to sit there and watch my friends sort of denounce me and insult me in public and it was hurtful it did it, it really hurt and i thought you know i'm not the guy who did anything wrong i'm not the guy who fixed a match right so i got very invested in that retribution and i wanted to see the retribution happen i wanted them to be punished and more importantly i wanted to be vindicated during this time and again i've never really talked about this a lot i got some of the this was easily some of the worst abuse i was responsible in the eyes of these teenagers for basically taking away this na team destroying the lives of these popular players and p predicated on a lie at this point it was six months before valve did anything and so i was getting ddosed you probably don't remember unless you're an old schooler but you know would get ddosed through skype and fucking uh, unbelievable abuse someone hacked my fucking email account and, and got my address and yeah it was it was fucking bad it was really really bad and so obviously i became and and, and it put you know it sounds stupid i mean look listen i'm a fucking journalist and a and a drinker i don't need an excuse to fuck up a relationship i don't need any help right i'm a fucking i'm an obsessive journalist with a fucking drink problem in 2015 not like now right i don't need your help i don't need any extra assistance to neglect a girlfriend or you know whatever but this was the same girlfriend who'd been with me during the fucking suicide thing so i was like it was on the outs anyway i was like really struggling to forgive her for how she treated and i'm still dealing with ptsd just from well not ptsd that's it wasn't ptsd it was survivor's guilt you know so anyway i threw myself into this story i wanted to be right i wanted to win so we won we won in we won in fucking you know january of this year of 2015 
and uh, they all got banned, right? And uh, I remember waking up that day that it was announced. They put out that uh, blog. What was it called? I've got the. I think I've got the name of the blog here. Integrity and fair play. And uh, I remember like all of my fucking Steam and Twitter and fucking whatever Skype and you know whatever else was just full it was just i just woke up i think it was one of those days you know waking up in the afternoon one of them and fucking just loads of messages and oh then and, and the general tenor of the message is you did it mate you you know you've wow this is huge this is like the biggest scandal in counter-strike and, and you did it so uh, scoot said it was like the shoeless joe jackson from the baseball scandal the baseball match fixing scandal and you know he like everybody was like singing my praises and sort of it was like waking up to like adulation but that only lasted for 24 hours before the vitriolic hatred sort of took over it but i felt pretty good because it had been so stressful so i was very like i was very much like yeah fuck those guys they deserve to be punished obviously now you know, I've settled on it once and for all. The punishment absolutely does not fit the crime. They should have been unbanned a long, long time ago. Keep in mind, this came after a Dota player who's still active now to this day, having done the exact same thing and only serving a year ban and Valve taking no particular hard line on it whatsoever. For me, they only banned them, I think, because I just wouldn't leave Valve alone. And I think it was almost... In retrospect, it was almost like a fuck you to me. That's how I've sort of come to feel about it. Because they just gave them lifetime bans, no appeal. <laughs> and I even went and appealed. I even went and appealed for them. I w w sat down with Valve on two occasions and said, can we not stop this madness now? It was very tough to sort of accept. But not now. Not in march of 2015 now the reason i'm bringing all this up is i'm talking about how the scene gets turbocharged and uh it does it, it, it's like it's really leveled up this is when we started thinking about observing as an art form and so this event is notable because steel after steel had had a breakdown which meant uh, he had a serious mental health breakdown with the absence of play very hard to watch that very hard to know that I did that to him and, and sort of watch him go through it publicly. You know, he was shaving his head on stream and getting banned from Twitch because he was, like, watching girls' streams on stream and then, like, saying, you know, do you hate this girl a seven or an eight? And it was like, wow, dude, you, this isn't you, man. It was, like, it was really, like, fucked up. And so, anyway, it, that, was, that was sort of tough to watch. But he turned it round and said, right, I'm going to be an observer. And he was. He was the best observer. All of... If you're an observer now basically like a prius you know you owe it to steel like steel was the steel was the maestro you know and he was hired to do this event and valve basically if i recall correctly valve said no he can't he can't even be an observer he can't even be around the game at all he can't be at a valve tournament he can't even be a fucking cameraman for counter-strike so that was really tough as well. The two observers were like Steel and a young man called Yanko, who I didn't meet at this event, I don't think, unless maybe I did. But uh, Yanko was uh, an observer at this event as well. And basically, this event is like super cool, it's pretty well observed. You had um, Alex is a horse now, machine, machine emerges. He's been in the wilderness doing all the shit games for ESL. He's doing Battlefield. He's He's doing mobile games i don't even know uh, he, he he eventually comes and emerges as top tier talent esl decide to give him an opportunity and what was really fucking wild was because of the knock-on effect of the i buy power bands and the implosion of the eg deal he caught ended up essentially teamless it became like a ronin <laughs> <laughs> and uh he was he was an analyst at this event and he was doing it with fucking Cadian. Cadian's career was meant to be over by 2015. Cadian was washed as fuck. Everyone in Denmark hated him for some reason. I've never understood why to this day. And so, yeah, the analysts were like Hiko and Cadian, which is mental because obviously after this, they just go on to have 
careers, like pretty sick careers. The Cadian hate in Denmark was absolutely out of control. And basically, I mean, he ends up in Rogue, you know, he has to go away and play in a fucking NA team to even have an opportunity to stay professional. When he started coming into the world of broadcasting, Cadian was like, you know what? He's going to be a guy. He's going to be a, he's going to be an analyst. He's going to be a full-time analyst. Get used to seeing him around. He's going to be so that we didn't think there was any way back for him as a player, but again, learned to be an IGL, learned to increase his value. The rest is history. I think Maui Snake's comments about him, I think they're fair, right? I think they're reasonable. You know, he might not get on the Mount Rushmore of IGLs, but I think he's had a pretty fucking solid career. Uh and certainly, you know, if you were to lay all of the IGLs and CS go end to end with this end being the fucking goats and that end being the shite he's closer to the goats than he is the shite by some distance so anyway yeah it was a strange broadcast a very very strange broadcast but a good one it was like it had quality it really felt like an event the crowd was really really good i say i was what did i do with uh, this one yeah i think i was just a journalist again i think i was there for like dot daily dot or something i, I mean i had a lot going on behind the scenes but obviously coming off the back of the i by power story you can imagine going to an event you got two types of reaction right you got the oh my god richard lewis the god tier journalist like basically people had forgotten about the 10 years i'd done before i by power people just forgot that they'd forgotten about how i'd battled with eg i'd battled with papa johns i'd fucking covered all the league of legends stuff you know i'd fucking I'd gone to war with total biscuit and fucking you know i'd uh, the people you know and, and 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 then made friends and forged an alliance they forgot that i was the unfiltered guy they forgot i was mr podcast before podcasts were even a thing all of that had gone and basically now i was the i buy power guy which was great for like the first three months it was nice everybody knew my name my name was now always adjacent to their names wasn't it which you think you want that as a journalist you think you want your byline to be recognized but actually no, it's not that fucking great and people people always say you know now even though i've broken loads of huge stories loads bigger than i buy power they uh they all said the same thing they all go oh, richard lewis he got that one story didn't he in 2015 he got that iba power story eight years ago you know didn't some didn't didn't some kid just give him a chat log <laughs> and that's it that's how i'm remembered now so yeah but so it was a weird event as well for me because like, i'm going out there you know and fucking the fans want to meet me and talk to me or they want to spit in my face and you don't know which type of interaction you're gonna get so i was pretty low-key at this one too uh in terms of the games i mean this one has some fucking good ones it's definitely got some interesting stories like probably people don't remember keyed stars probably don't remember but that was the fallen and fur lineup that was basically the one that he changed to totally change the face of brazil keyed stars had like you know, they made it to the playoffs. A lot of people were wondering just how far they could go. They had a really tough time because they got Virtus Pro and they got Virtus Plowed. Then you had, yeah, you had the Danes that always lost to NIP. Essentially, you go through and you end up with El Clasico as the fucking final. And this is widely regarded as one of the best five up, up until you get to like the likes of boston and stuff like that this was regarded as the best major final fanatic versus nip el classico we don't even have el classico now we just got el trashico it's a fucking joke there's nothing even equivalent to this but fanatic playing nip in 2015 all that fucking skill all that rivalry 16 14 16 10 16 13 back and forth classic maps by the way this is the best map pool probably we've ever had dust 2 cash inferno classic rock'em sock'em maps with a fucking bangalang economy that encourages fighting and kills god it's fucking great this is counter strike as it should be so i've got a lot of good memories about this one this really had solid production value solid teams in attendance cool stories like the emergence of keyed oh shit i didn't even say tsm of course had come in and picked up the danes the danes were playing for tsm you even had remember probably one of the worst teams to ever be in a top eight at any major ever 
You had fucking... You had Penta Sports. Do you remember Penta? I bet you don't. No one remembers Penta, right? This team is easily the worst ever to get top eight in a major, I think. Dennis and Spiddy. Uh, Dennis and Spiddy were absolutely fucking diabolically, you know, bad. I love Dennis, though, because he's, he's a legend. He took it super well. And Crystal... Crystal, the former cheater in Counter Strike Source, uh, who went on a redemption. Really weird. You know how like people tell you that cheaters are going to be like absolute like they're pieces of shit and action. And you you get like you um, uh, like overly emotionally invested teenagers who are like really into the game. They're always like, oh, you, sh you should go to prison. They should go to prison. <laughs> and it's like. Crystal used to be a cheater when he was super young, and he got caught, and it was super blatant. And he, he was like a bit of an outcast in Counter Strike Source because of that. And yet, when I met Crystal, because I was the Counter Strike Source guy, there was sort of some expectation that I was like going to be hostile towards him. Keep in mind, because in Source, yeah, he was German, but the best thing in Source at the end of Source was playing in the fucking German ESL Pro League. That was like. The ESL Pro League now for CSGO, basically the German ESL Pro League was that in source. And it used to, like the Saudi Arabian Football League, it used to, imp used to import all the best players. So you had like, you know, British players, UK players going and playing in the fucking German League. With like MT M MTW and SK Gaming, even Thermal Take, you know, teams like this. So anyway... Because I'd come from Source and the Germans used to cheat their tits off in Source, and by the way, probably in every game ever in an online game, like you could probably fucking fire up Heroes of Might and Magic 3 and get cheated on by a fucking German right now, but whatever. The point is, there was this expectation that I was going to be like fucking hostile towards him, like when I met him, and I sort of was like, oh, Crystal, yeah? And he's like a small, he looks like a fucking hobbit. He's a small guy with a sweet little face, barely got stubble porking through and it, it was crazy like what a nice guy he was and then I, I even met him at another event it might have been the one we did in germany take tv and he, his mother baked a cake for me <laughs> he's like i i we had, I had such a good time talking to you last time i got my mother to bake you a cake i was like yeah wicked i'm fat yeah that's great i love food so he was like he was a super super nice guy like he was like the fucking sweetest guy and it just like didn't pass because everybody like fucking hated him <laughs> and it was like so weird was he a good player in csgo though no he wasn't was he and then they had trouble on this team and i probably shouldn't talk too much about this because it's sad trubly where was the player that went on to have serious mental health issues and what he's known for now isn't being part of penta sports top eight at a major he's now known for being um the guy that uh stalked bjergsen in the uh, lcs or lec or whatever it was or well, he got arrested i think yeah, really sad. He had a very serious mental health crisis that, you know, cut his playing career short, unfortunately. And uh, I do believe he got the help he need, needed. So for those who don't know, you'll be able to Google it. But basically, I think Bjergsen used to talk about it quite a lot. There was a guy who was like basically stalking him and, and, and you know, he would be outside the T he'd be outside the TSM team house, basically. He traveled to, to you know, fucking harass Bjergsen basically and so yeah last I heard he's he's better now you know so good for him but it looked to be like a, a manic episode of some sort but anyway so Penta Sports uh, the worst uh, uh, team ever in a major to get top 8 but don't worry Fnatic absolutely battered him so and of course Fnatic absolutely handled Nip as well and this is the Fnatic era this is 2015 this is vintage Fnatic you've all seen time travel Lan I'm sure so what do, how do I feel about this one this is a great event, Katowice. This is a solid, solid major. This is like one of the good ones where, again, we've got good games, a good good storylines, a broader kind of cross-section of teams from all over the world. I'm going to put this in A-tier. This is an A-tier event. A lot of fond memories of this one. Next up, Cologne 2015. This is a great event. So I'm a journalist again. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not working this one. But this, this was notable for 
a bunch a bunch of stuff esl had got a fuck ton of money for this they got a ton of sponsors i want to say this is where they pulled in like some insane fucking deal with the score the score had just launched their esports app and i think they were they were paying a fortune to dreamhack and esl to basically fucking promote them and pump them intel it was weird because you know about the esl one events and i know everybody denies this at esl but again i was there i know so obviously the esl one brand was essentially created so they could have daughter events if they wanted to because riot games wanted to be on the intel extreme masters exclusively with no rival moba adjacent to that to them so esl1 got created as an offshoot so they could essentially double dip this is well documented you know if, if you were there you know where to look for all of the clues but esl have always denied that and said they were always going to create this splinter brand and blah 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 but anyway so esl1 cologne was like huge they had so much money to spend they'd just brought in joe miller and d-man not that long ago and that was considered a huge deal because joe miller and d-man by now are the number one casting duo in league of legends everybody loves them beloved by the community they are the go-to guys for the big games joe miller veteran pro d-man call of duty legend that you know uh, for call of duty 4 together doing league of legends they grew the synergy they were like they were like the testosis of league of legends basically and obviously this is where I fell out with D-Man because of... I had the story that they were leaving. I asked Joe and, and Lee for comment, and I knew them. Uh, and they both said, we don't want to give you a comment because we don't want to fuck up the deal or do anything improper for any party. But we'll refer you to a Riot Games press officer who will give you a comment. They told Riot. Riot messaged me and said, oh, yeah, just hold on we'll give you a comment and then riot games basically sent an email out going richard lewis is going to break the story that joe miller and d-man are leaving for esl and the email was we cannot have richard lewis break our news that was what they said and so anyway they riot put a statement out basically saying fucking yeah they're going and they they scooped me they they took my story away and i said to joe and lee i said cheers mate thanks for getting those cunts involved when you could have just given me a wink and lee said look mate our hands are a bit tied and he sent an email and i was so raging at the time i basically put that email out publicly and the email was i didn't cut out that d-man had sent it to me basically and i said this is the state of riot games and then d-man went what the f lee went what the fuck have you done that for and I was like, oh, sorry, mate. I was on a tablet and I didn't even see that your name was on there. Like, sorry, bud. And he went, this, me and you never speak again. And he was as good as his word. And, you know, he's got every right to be angry. That, that story always gets told. Richard Lewis outed a source. Lee's never been a source on any story for me. Uh, Lee wasn't a source on this story. He was the opposite of a source. He was the guy who got me fucking scooped. So, you know. I fucked up on that one. That is my bad. But I didn't outsource on the story. And look, just to also put it in context, D-Man was in full fucking diva mode when he got when he got the move to ESL. Like, I remember bumping into him. I hadn't seen Lee in a long time. Lee was like a dude that basically we used to go to the Call of Duty events and we would just get fucked up. And Lee, Lee was a mess. You know, he was a fucking mess. And I was a mess. I mean, I was an even bigger mess. Like, n no joke. I was full chaos mode back then. Like, I was a, I was an animal. But anyway, the, uh, you know, so we would go to these events and we would get fucked up together. I fucking loved Lee then. He was great. Great guy. But the time at Riot Games, you know, using the community to leverage a job, becoming one of the biggest commentators in the world in esports, and then getting this huge plush move to ESL where he wouldn't just be a caster in any game he wanted ever. He would also be picking the talent and doing all this he was like an executive it just blew his fucking ego up and so I, I, rem I remember even prior to the incident bumping into him at like an esl event and uh i remember bumping him in, into like in a hotel lobby 
and he would look like he'd had a peel or Botox or something. It was so surreal. I'd barely recognised him. He looked like a fucking mannequin. Like I was like, Lee, is that is that you, mate? And he was all fucking shiny, and he was shiny and smooth. I, I've never seen anything like it. Now, look, look, I'm not the type. I, I moisturise occasionally. Like I've been known to moisturise. But I'm not like I'm not mad on all that shit, right? Like I'm, I just I'm okay with having a big leathery face and a drinker's nose and a beard that looks like I've swallowed half a bear and left its ass hanging out. That's all all right with me, like right. But anyway, he just looked so fucking smooth and weird to the point of barely recognising. So I didn't know if he'd had some work done or whatever. But also as well, I was like, Lee, mate, it's been ages. How are you doing? And he just could not be asked. Like he made it abundantly clear in that moment uh, uh, that journalist Richard Lewis was utterly beneath him in the packing order and i've known this guy for years i've known him for years i've been drinking with him at a fucking eye series for fuck's sake you know what i mean and then he just like he just gave me the royal treatment he just said it was it was like one of them it was like i have to go over there now it was like it was like spinal tap when they meet in the lobby you know he, he like said i have to go over there now and he just moved like 10 feet and sat down with like the big names you know the big esports names so his ego was fucking already getting crazy, like, you know what I mean? It was like... And then obviously at this event, it's famous for him inserting himself into a final. Because, oh, that was the other thing. Yeah, fuck, here you go. Here's, here's a little bit of spice. Because I think by this point, he was still pissed off about me fucking up with the email, which fair enough. But it also meant I was a journalist with a press pass, but I wasn't... Usually because it's me, I used to get, right, you're a journalist, there's your press pass, and then somebody from ESL, or DreamHack, or Gfinity, or whoever it was, they would come down and go, and there's your VIP pass, right, this event, D-Man was so pissed off at me, still, he basically was like saying, Richard can't get, you know, no backstage access, you know, I don't want him anywhere near me, I don't want him anywhere near the casters, so I was like fucking super limited in what I could do, and like, I gotta be honest, I, I was getting used to the good life, I was getting used to just being able to go anywhere, talk to anyone, and instead I was up in the fuck. I was back where I started in the little dingy press room with all the goblins who were there just for a fucking free t-shirt and to meet their favourite player, writing for 99damage.de <laughs> you know what i mean i got fucking i got i got bumped back to square one at this event so that wasn't a good feeling but this event was sick this event was fucking great so many uh wicked moments remember as well this was like the this was the gsl format one uh, you know, you had brackets in the groups. You got a ton of fucking great games. This was also super world representative because this is where you have Renegades. So my boy Chad was was over at this event as a player, and obviously it was good to see him again from CGS. So that was great. There were two Australian teams there. You had CLG emerge and fill the eye by Power Void as best as they could. Tarek and Hazed obviously emerging with the you know FNS, uh, JDM and Cutler, good lineup. Tight, uh, Titan with Existence, RPK, Shocks, Maniac, Smith still. You know, they, there was this was like a great time for CSGO. A lot of romanticism in this one. Na'Vi as well had brought Flamey in to replace Starix. Flamey was a very exciting player at that moment in time. Yeah, it was just great. It was just really good. Oh, and of course, Luminosity uh, at this point. Is, we've discovered the talent of Cold Zera. Cold Zera's at this major. So this is great. And on top of that, you've got a really big broadcast team you know pansy's there fantastic moses the analyst henry's in fifth lauren shout out in the in the chat uh was there as an analyst kadian did it as well zoe from overwatch was there doing some stuff in the stadium she's one of the most underrated C uh underrated esports talents bar none in the whole world she can do everything like she's fucking great chobra traditionally been you know more involved in like starcraft daughter and he came over and did some hosting uh so it was like a re there were like new names but also it was like scaling up you know cs was now the big swinging dick we went and got joe miller back we went and got d-man back we're bringing in people from all 
uh, other games, you know, like Chobra was coming from South Korea to do this stuff. We've got ex-players on the desk, like decorated people like hey, Fifth Lauren and Henry G and, you know, Cadian and all this. We've got Anders and Semler. Probably this is... I mean, you can make an argument about what era of Anders and Semler you like. For me, this was sort of... 2015 is basically peak uh, before people started attacking Semler. Uh, in by 2016, where I started to notice stuff was creeping in, uh, and people were being pointless and hostile towards him. But yeah, this was great. This was just like a fucking great broadcast. Yeah, it's got the it's got the Anders face where it looks like somebody's just found his fucking prostate, like like straight up there. He's like, Aah! he just fucking he's out. He's got that Listerine face. It's great. It, it was just huge. This is just a fucking great event. Uh, and like I say, the games are fucking sick, and you get a ton of them. But the, let's just focus on the playoffs for every one of these. All two wars in the quarterfinals, but doesn't tell the full story because the envious Navi game was, you know, back and forth. There was a good map in the uh, VP and NIP game, and you know what? everybody thought we were going to see Fnatic LG go three maps. We all thought Luminosity were going to get it done, and it just didn't happen. You have the classic moment as well, if memory serves me correct, when Fnatic beat Virtus Pro, because in the crowd, I was out in the crowd. I even had a few beers while I was working again. I'm a journalist, who gives a fuck? So I was out in the crowd. There was a huge, huge Virtus Pro fans, like just a huge sea of them banners super loud cheering this is this is the event that puts cologne on the map as like I said this was the one the cathedral of counter-strike not 2014 it's 2015 this is when you have to have a cologne in your fucking you know in your season every year you've got to go to cologne it's there and obviously you know Virtus pro fanatic have this you know close game fanatic are out on top because fanatic are the boys they are the best team right now and uh it's the moment where taz basically like the crowd are booing fanatic fanatic still despised because of boost all the cheating clips all the theories about how like oh have you noticed how shocks has got those clips too after he taught after he called flusher a cheater but then said ah he's not really a cheater and now flusher has given him his cheat and there was all this like insane narrative going on and so that was where taz come out to the crowd and said don't boo them they're like worthy champions which is one of the most baller things it's classic taz because it's like spotlight but it's also one of the most baller things that ever happened at a major like taz coming out and telling they like, don't boo our opponents because we fucking we play they're great they're great guys they're a great team and you should support them it's sick it's actually sick it's like if you were watching a fucking real sports event and somebody did that like in you know M think about like an mma or something like that you know what i mean like it, it it was a great gesture it was it was it was a fantastic moment the crowd fully got behind it it really changed the kind of feeling coming into the finals i saw a lot of those Virtus pro fans actually turn up for the last day uh you know are you listening brazil uh and fanatic and envy put on a you know a, a good first map on dust two de france as it was but Fnatic are just too good. I think everything, all told, while this one might be a bit over-romanticized, I do have to say that, you know, this is probably an... Uh, is it S-tier? It might be the highest of the years so far, but is it S-tier? Uh, high year, very high year. But we've got to have professional standards here, and it's an A+, plus for sure, but not quite s S is going to be reserved. There have only been... Because, you know, if, to get an S tier for me, your event has to be amazing. I have to be working it. No, I'm just kidding. Your event has to be amazing. I have to be the host. And uh, it's you've got to compare it to all of the other esports events that there's been. It's got to stand on its own. And I have to host it. So, next up, Cluj Napoca. Well, well, well. I do believe I'm hosting this one. Cluj Napoca. This event was hell on earth. Absolute hell to work. I am going to just lay it all out. Put it in D for now. You know the rules. Everybody knows the rules. I mean, this is one of the worst events I ever worked. Like, you've got to understand how bad this was. Like, Dreamhack 
were notoriously slipshod behind the scenes. Like, we basically used to dig DreamHack out of so many fucking holes all the time as talent. Because they were nice guys, they were fun guys, before they just turned into little backbiting corporate arseholes, which is about now, right? About now in, in 2015. This is when they betrayed Robert Olin, who'd given them all jobs. It, it, it's, tell you the story about this, right? Because it, it, it's got to go somewhere. So it, it's important context for why DreamHack became absolute scum. Robert Olin was a genius. Robert Olin, I used to call him the Mad King, right? Because Robert Olin was uh, uh, he was one of the good swedes right i know you're like what yeah he was the viking descendant he liked to party he liked to drink he liked to take risks he would go on podcasts and say outrageous things drunk out of his mind and this was like a major esports figure but he didn't give a fuck because he had his own company he had dream hack and he was beloved in Jon Sherping. Jon Sherping, ironically, given Robert Olin's predilections, uh, is like the Bible belt of fucking Sweden. Like, it's like it's dry. You can't get booze anywhere, and what you can is super expensive, and it's a wretched, miserable place to go. And if it wasn't for Dream Act, no one would fucking know it exists. So Robert Olin, back in the early esports days, recognised this opportunity. If I bring you a huge gaming festival, right... And bring young people and money to your strange, weird little part of Sweden. You give me a discount on this venue and at the hotel and across the road from the venue. And we'll all make it work and we'll all make money and we'll do this twice a year. And Dream Act went from being a fucking deranged idea to being the single largest gaming festival in the world, eclipsing even stuff in like China and Korea at that time. It was massive. It was like... I remember the first time I went to a DreamHack. It was like going to fucking Mecca. It was the eSports Mecca. You, you you made the pilgrimage. and It literally felt like a fucking journey because you have to fly into Stockholm. Then you have to get a fucking coach to fucking Jon Sherping, one of them like late night coaches where you're just on a bus for six fucking hours you know but it's sweden it's not like you're getting a bus in america or britain it's like sweden so it's like oh i've got a power bank you know this is wicked I've got internet fucking hell this is, it's a progress a progressive advanced country anyway you would then drive all the way on sherpa then you've got to get to the venue which is on the outskirts and a huge hotel across the road from it that everybody stays in and it was it was massive and mental but once you got there whew, it was the best you were in that hotel you would see everyone you would see all the players all the commentators we would all be drinking at that bar until like 2 a.m and some obviously very often beyond it was the last time esports felt like a community i think was probably there was some some moment at dream hat uh, in that in that world but anyway i loved robert olin i owe him a lot and he gave me all my opportunities to be on a broadcast he promoted me for podcasting he got me in with like the good studio i spent some time over there even though i never appeared on a broadcast and uh he really did a lot for me he, was, he saw something in me that i didn't even really see in myself and so like a lot of geniuses <laughs> he had some fucking demons you know and his marriage wasn't going particularly well and he didn't want to lose the company in the divorce because Swedish divorce laws, he was going to get fucking skinned alive. So he tried to be slick, and he transferred control of DreamHack to his father, so he wouldn't get skinned in said divorce. His father said, yeah, of course I'll do that for you. And so he took control of the company on paper and did that. And then Robert thought, okay, well, look, at least I don't lose the thing I built. I might lose the house, <laughs> I might have to fucking see the kids on the weekend, but at least I get to keep all a dream hack, right? And what you have to remember is, I think by this point, there were lots of talk about dream hack being bought by MTG, a big sort of Swedish media company it was going to be a really big deal mtg had been doing more and more esports content and they were going to potentially buy dreamhack to be their esports you know puff the, the jewel in the crown of the esports portfolio so he ended up giving it to his dad and the first thing his dad did was right how do we get robert out the company 
how do we get Robert out the company? And Robert, on the way up to being uh, the boss, he had made so many careers people, you know, like you know, who were at the company, and he'd given them voting powers. He'd given them board positions. He'd made them CEOs, COOs, CFOs, you know, whatever fucking UFOs, you know, whatever the fucking title was. And uh, they had a vote, right? They got a vote. So Robert Olin's father called a meeting, an extraordinary general meeting, about the removal of Robert from his own company he built. And all of those rats who were still, some of them still at the company to this day, all of the rats that Robert Olin had fucking given a career to, they voted him out. They empowered his father to push him out of his own company. So they justified it at the time. Because I remember being livid with them, I, I told a lot of them. And keep in mind, I'm working for DreamHack at this time, right? I told them what I thought of them. I said, that is some of the most shady shit I've ever heard of in, in eSports. They said, oh, you don't, you know what Robert was like. He used to drink all the time. He didn't do anything at the event. You know, stuff used to fucking fall apart because he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. And we had to fix it. You know, and it was, it was super hard. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't the guy he was when he made the company and all this blah, blah, blah. And it's, I don't give a fuck if he was fucking unconscious for the entire, like, you wore that guy. If you've ever took a penny from DreamHack, you wore that guy. There was no Dream. Robert Orlin is fucking DreamHack. He got the key to Jon Sherpin, for fuck's sake. The mayor from Jon Sherpin were like, yeah, this, this town would really, this town would be a fucking dust ball if it wasn't for you. You know, he was a fucking legend. He was an absolute legend. But, they, uh, but you know, he got Julius Caesar on the fucking steps of the Senate. Everybody had a stab. Everybody fucked them over. So anyway, Robert Orlin ends up losing the company. And just to fucking rub salt in the wound, he lost the company. No shares, right? N nothing. Got like three months severance like he was a pleb employee. And then they sold to MTG for about, what was it, 40 million euros? And he didn't get a penny. And all of those dudes who voted him out got that. <laughs> and his dad got that. <laughs> who had fuck all to do with anything. And then he went into that divorce that he was terrified of. And got fucking skinned in that. So he went crazy. He stopped talking to me. Said I was said I was a mini Mussolini or something. He, you know, it's sad. But I love that man. If he called me up tomorrow, I'd be there in a heartbeat. I'd fucking do anything for him but that's the story of dream hack yeah he called me a mini mussolini over the six months at bright bar basically so i mean shit man everyone was calling me fucking names at that point so anyway to the event uh so this is dream hack this this, this was collusion of poker so dream hack traditionally did like swedish events they started moving around they're doing things they want to do an event in romania bucharest surely well no because that's a that's a pgl town right so and pgl had come in and they were doing production at DreamHack. But DreamHack, for some reason, wanted to do Cluj. I don't, I don't know to this day why we ended up doing Cluj. This is back when DreamHack and PGL were, like, pretty simpatical. So PGL was the inn in Romania, but they didn't want to do the big city in Romania, even though PGL were based in Bucharest. So we end up in fucking Cluj. And look, I'm not going to say anything disparaging <laughs> about Romania. I like Romania. I've been to Romania many times, been to Bucharest many times. Uh, every time I went there for PGL events, he used to put me up in this wicked five-star hotel. Everyone was super nice. I've had many a good many a good night out there, uh, including, of course, the, the night of uh, Henry Jin and Sado Pissed, that story that many of you remember. I, I, lo I love going there, but not Cluj. <laughs> No, I'm not Cluj. The drive from our hotel to Cluj, there was a coach for us every day. We all filed on the coach. And then we would drive away from the hotel, just into this sort of wasteland, right? And we knew we were getting near the venue because we would, like, pass these, like, huge, like, like pipes that looked, they looked like... You know when they do the they put the missile on the truck in like Soviet Russia and they drive it out and the everyone marches. Look at our missiles and it fucking it was like it looked like that. It looked like them. 
and I don't understand, like, I, to this day, I don't know what the fuck it was. We would go to the venue, and the venue was fucking, like, I don't know, it was like, it was in a, a Cluj is a place, it is, you know, it's not, it wasn't, it, we just had to drive through this weird wasteland to get there, and when we got there, the venue was fucking huge, unfeasibly large, right, which sounds great, not when you have to fucking walk around, and so immediately I knew, oh no, fucking hell's bells, all of the amenities were at one side of this like giant, I don't even know what the building was meant to be, <laughs> I couldn't tell you, so it was a, all the amenities were at one side of the building, upstairs, up about two flights of stairs, that was where things were, we were doing it on the other side. So basically, imagine it's like this. Amenities, vending machines, toilets, etc. Flights of stairs, halls, rooms, offices, things. Then through that huge stadium area with the stage here and then row after row of chairs and, bulk and, and bleachers and then back there, is my stage, and then back there is a green room. But the amenities are here, <laughs> and the green room is here. And I say green room. The green room, it looked like a fucking interrogation chamber. You walked in, and it was like just a fold-out chair in the middle of the room. Like, uh, you know, you were going to sit on it and someone's going to come in and put a fucking bag over your head and beat the soles of your feet till you confess. It would look like, oh, what the fuck is this? So I knew what was going to happen at Collusion of Poker. I knew how bad it was going to be. And there was already weird shit going on. Like, there's people in the there's people in the fucking talent that didn't get on. Sadakis and Semla didn't get on. And, you know, there was already, like, weird shit going on because, like... We'd all took a pay cut so Moses could come and do it because we re we all really loved Jason and we wanted him there and so people lowered their rates so he could, so we all collectively lowered our rates so they would have enough to pay him because Dreamhack was fucking trying to lowball everyone like they always fucking do everything's got to be a saga everything's got to be a negotiation we're all getting there it's weird it's tense everyone's drinking immediately because. We're in clues. What else are we going to do? We're not even in... The hotel isn't even in clues, as I said. The hotel is in some fucking... Just the middle of nowhere, desolate wasteland. Soviet era. <laughs> Fuck knows. So, yeah. Anyway, at the event, for the first, like, two, three days, there is no bottled water. None. Anywhere. Can't get it. Can't get it. Door stuck. <laughs> you know? There was no bottled water. So, I... Can't express how important water is when you're working with your voice. It's it's beyond important. So, okay. No bottled water for two days. Now, I'm not drinking Cluj water. Uh, again, I'm not being disparaging, guys. I'm just not drinking your tap water. That's fine. I don't even drink my own. I don't even drink British tap water. It's not It's not about you, right? I don't drink tap water. The, you know, Alex Jones had a point. They are turning the frogs gay, aren't they? So, I'm not drinking that tap water. <laughs> That's getting clipped out of context people think i'm being genuine there but anyway i just don't drink tap water right i just don't i just don't do it fuck it who cares they're probably putting shit in the, the microplastics are gonna get me whatever someone's gonna but you know uh, whatever so i'm not drinking cluj water but because i'm thinking i'll get sick i'll get diarrhea you know like you can just happen it doesn't even have to be bad water if you're just not used to it you get what they call traveler's diarrhea i'm not doing a i'm not doing an event with diarrhea that's madness right so anyway the production is a shit show on the first few days as well. So we are doing, I think, the longest day of Cluj. I think we did an 18-hour day. And I'm the host. And I'm thinking, Yahoo! Mario Jump. I'm the host of the major. Woo! Fucking making it to the big time. Finally, Dream Act giving me a chance to level up my game and show the CSGO fans what they've been missing out on. And everybody was raving about this talent. By the way, it's one of the most god-tier talent lineups in any esports event ever. Let me just read it off for you. The hosts, Richard Lewis, Hall of Famer, esports, Lifetime Achievement Award recipient, Red Eye. Then the interviewers, Parler, can't have everything, Sir Scoots, was doing the interviews as well. So we, Scoots has been bumped to being an interviewer. 
on the analyst desk, you've got Thorin, you've got Fiflaren, you've got Natu, you've got Moses, the commentators, Henry G, Sadikist, Anders, Semler, DDK, Bardolf. It's fucking God tier. It's God tier. That's like S tier talent right there, like almost across the board. So the mad thing about it was, because <laughs> I'll, I'll tell this little part of the story now, just because it's going to fit. All of that, we were all feeling great. We, there's a there's a wicked picture we took of all of us on the desk. And that, <laughs> we got home and immediately on Twitter, what did I see? CS Go has had one of the biggest esports events of all time uh, for a million dollars or you know, whatever it was. And it said, a sele- a quarter of a million dollars. And it said a selection of 14 of the best broadcast talent uh was was there all of them were men and i was like oh cool. can i have, can i have something can i just why is this happening like i'm sorry please please can i enjoy it for a day can i enjoy it for a day no you can't enjoy it for a day richard it's esports it's shit and you must be miserable all the time so we had that doing the rounds and then that threw up the subsequent debate mm, yeah you know couldn't they couldn't they have hired a woman and they say yeah we could or my dad didn't do the hiring why are you shouting at me like fucking hell i would have loved pansy to be there what you're talking about you know fuck <laughs> why am i the why am i the bad guy mental but anyway so anyway whatever back to this so day one nightmare day two worse day three still no bottle water you know still no food still nothing and uh, we get back to the hotel and we are fucking flagging i mean you have to you know look you know this but i'll just say it for the purposes of what is now already an overly long stream and this is going to be part one for sure not even of two parts but probably three parts at this point but anyway the point being when you do an event where you have to be on right like energy like what i'm doing now like i have to make it interesting i have to put intonation in my voice i can't just phone it in i gotta gesticulate i gotta pay attention i gotta be sharp right when you're dialed in like that you then get back to the hotel right and so it looks like you can get five six hours sleep but you can't because you have to go to sleep and your brain won't let you your brain's up your brain's like zing, 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 zing. here's some ideas what about tomorrow's show you want to do this wasn't that game good what about this can we get that and you're just sat there with this like so you, you fucking you try and you got two choices you either deal with the fucking endless loop of fucking nonsense in your head until like a fucking a dog with the zoomies it fucking stops and you get two three hours sleep or you fuck your brain with booze and then whatever sleep you get you halved it anyway so you just feel like you had two hours or three hours of sleep that's it <laughs> they're your two choices so when you do that obviously over you do that for a night you do that for two nights it's fine by day three day four you are fucking falling apart and the thing was, the casters were getting sleep and getting to go back, you know, go back to the hotel or having a little nap in a cubby hole somewhere. And, you know, you get grab an hour, grab a power nap, top up your levels. The host can't go nowhere. The host can't go nowhere. I'm fucked. And even though we had two hosts for some reason, I don't even know what happened. I barely got any breaks, as I recall. I had to be there the whole time. That was it. The way it was scheduled was, it wasn't like, I do half a day, Paul does the other half. It was like, Paul does a game, I do a game. It was like that. It's like, no, this is the worst way. So I just couldn't, I couldn't do anything. And so we're back at the hotel, and everyone is fucking fuming. I mean, listen, if you think it's just me, that's fair enough. But it isn't just me. Like, people at these events, you know, like, listen, it's particularly bad. Remember, everyone's took a pay cut, so we're not even getting big money, right? We're, we're, we're sat there, right? It's Dream Act anyway, so you never get big money. <laughs> you, and, we've, and we're getting less than that. And we're sat there in the hotel drinking, and everyone's just like, fuck it. This is just unacceptable. I haven't had a good night's sleep since I got here. 18 hour days are fucking crazy, especially for the amount we're getting paid. I may as well have a fucking McDonald's job. It'd work out better. This is just so crazy, the hourly rate here. You know, everyone's absolutely fucking f- just losing it. And th- we nearly went on strike. <laughs> we, like, 
There were serious discussions around the table. Why don't we just tell them tomorrow we're not coming in to do the show collectively unless you meet these basic conditions. We need snacks. We need water. We, you know, we need a seating area with, with, you know, we need a monitor so we can watch the fucking games without having to go into the bleachers with the fans. So anyway, and every, every, everyone was big up on that idea. They were like, fucking yeah, let's go then. Let's do it. Let's fucking do it. Let's strike. I don't know how this happened, but Semla somehow became essentially like the voice of reason. <laughs> which you know people are like yeah, yeah, fuck ten, then, yeah. Semler was the voice of reason I was kind of indifferent I'm just like I'll just do what y'all want to do I don't really give a fuck I'm miserable as fuck already like I want to go home but Semler was like look guys look we can we, we need to work together we need to work together and uh <laughs> we can communicate with DreamHack we know these people we like these people let's just keep our shit together let's keep our shit together think of the show and let's go forward and and get it done and so anyway we're like oh uh, whatever man and so anyway semler was off making things happen and then i got involved and i was telling them like this is a list of things that we absolutely have to have by the way guys like you've got to find these things bottled water surely can be achieved <laughs> you know and so anyway by the f- fifth day i want to say we finally got a working production so we're only doing 12 hour days now or whatever we've got a sit down green room cordoned off area we've got bottled water we they brought in a ton of snacks and like ramen and fucking pot noodles and a kettle and coffee it's all laid out and i think it was nixon formerly of hltv came out and basically said like they got us all round for the, for the day and they basically like gave us all a groveling apology unfortunately (laughs) by that point i was fucked i was in the bin i the sleep had caught up with me that was famously when i said to scoots like i'm trying to not let the rest of the troops know but i'm super weak and irritable right now i just haven't had a a sleep it's just killing me that was when scoots famously said get the fuck out my industry (laughs) that was when he screamed in my face when i just just needed a pep talk so everybody was fucked at this event it was terrible and so anyway it just goes to show you much like how oh toxicity yeah you can't win your games where you're toxic right it's just a lie just you can scream at people and still win you guys would never have known this tournament is sick this broadcast was sick everybody brought their a game I went back and watched the way we did things. This was where I started. I was doing these like intros where and outros where every time we threw to a break, you know, I would like do some wordplay. So, you know, if it was like, I don't know, I'm fucking going to butcher some examples now. But like if it was like, I don't know, uh, Envious, uh, you know, versus, uh, you know, Titan, you know, you'd do something like, and after the break, you know, we're going to see if... Uh, the titans will be slain or you know shit like that you know and, and 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 or whether the french will become the envy of other cs courting i would do all this stuff i would do this intro like an outro for all of it and i was writing them down like in real time doing them and it was super sick and it was super slick and it was really good and it's something i should have kept doing uh but you know he doesn't have a time at the events or whatever so anyway you had that you had the fact that on by the numbers i'd called it as well i had said that envy were going to win this major they did but it just doesn't tell the full story this was like there was just loads going on here. The games were fucking mega. You had, obviously, en- the the envious Fnatic game was like a shock to the system because, obviously, it's Fnatic and envious fucking manhandled them. Like, they absolutely battered them. Came back from a map down and did it. Then you had the insane story about G2. This is the G2 that went on to become phase. You know, again, sa- stop me if this sounds like a ridiculous uh lino you know makalele fox rain dennis jacob this was when jacob emerged as like the fucking he was he was like the breakout star here everyone was like holy shit where's this guy come from he had like just so many like but him and makalele had like in just insane amounts of, of, of clutches 
And, you know, keep in mind, they're dragging Fox kicking and screaming through these games as well. Like, Fox is not a player at this point. I don't give a fuck. That was where, famously, I think it was, like, did McAuley say, like, oh, Fox is a great teammate because he, he'll run across the map to drop a Glock for me. You know what I mean? And it was just like, for fuck's sake. BTN got a lot of mileage out of that guy, basically, you know. So, anyway, the Jacob performance and the McAuley performance in this is out of this world. The idea of G2... That G2 being in a semi-final of a major, and not only that, taking a fucking map off, off a winner, and probably the most epic map of the event is the double OT between Envy and G2, that, you know, G2 nearly knocked Envy out, they were a map up, you know, you go in a double OT against Envy, Envy battle back, and this was, like, when you still had, like, prime fucking Kenny S popping off and stuff. So it was great. And then, obviously, it just took... It being so close, it just took it out of them. But you also had Na'Vi. This is the Na'Vi that, like... If, if you didn't think Envious were going to do it, and not many people did, this was the Na You thought Na'Vi were going to do it. Flame, he's maintained his form. He's proved to be a great player since he's joined. Guardian is absolutely fucking sick and seized. We used to call him in 2015. He was budget crims. He was cut price crims. Like, seized was that good at that point. And so you had, like, some really, really fucking, you know, good games all the way through this tournament. The broadcast is sick. The final... Yeah, well, it's a major final. You know how that goes. Uh, this wasn't, like, really a classic. You get a 16-5 in it, you know, on fucking cobblestone. You know, Envy on cobblestone were a fucking nightmare. So, it's one of them, you know, where it wasn't, like, a great final. But it was a really great storyline. And Envy, remember as well, you know, just a, another fucking anecdote. Since this really isn't a tier list anymore, is it? It's rich and tell stories about the history of the CSGO majors. But that's fine. People might like that. People might not like it. Whatever. Envious as well, just in general, having come in. Envious, it was a huge deal. It was a huge deal. When Team Envious came in in, like, 2014, they were this big Call of Duty, you know, made by Hasbro, big Call of Duty brand. Hasbro, of course, would have been this huge decorated player in Call of Duty, set up his own organisation, real big pioneer like that, and Hastro, I met him at a Gfinity for the first time ever, and he was scouting for which team he was going to pick up, and I, I, I might have told this story before, but basically he came to me because I knew Hastro because he was the first ever Call of Duty player from, well, first ever, first ever console player, full stop, uh, we'd ever interviewed on... Um, on Cadred, and he was super professional about it, you know, he was a nice guy back then, very humble, he was super good about it, he, he had set him up with a junior journalist, he fucking did the interview, it was a stellar piece of content, nobody read it, and everyone said, oh, you cover any old shit on Cadred these days, it's not Counter-Strike, so I knew him, and he said, like, let's get a beer, you know, let's meet up, and so anyway, we met in Gfinit, we met in London, he came out there because he was scouting for players, and he said, wow, Richard, like, it's an honor to meet you. He was super fucking really gracious. I was like, fuck, dude, who the fuck am I? You know, like, uh, I'm, I'm fucking nobody. Like, you're one of the most decorated, you know, Call of Duty players, fucking, you know, loads of followers. You've started your own org, being super successful, entrepreneur, you know. So he was like, no, it's really great to meet you, man. Like, I love your work in Counter-Strike, followed you for many years. And, you know, I've got, like, a favor to ask. I just wondered if, like, you'd give me your candid thoughts about what team to pick up in in in, in Counter Strike, and I went, bro, you can have that. You don't need to. You don't even need you know to lay it on thick, man. I'll tell. I'll, I'll tell you. I love talking Counter Strike. So we went. And we had a beer, and he wanted to get a CS team, and I said, well, who do you like? Who do you want? And he said, I want the Poles. I want Virtus Pro. I want the Polish. He said, like, they're outspoken. Taz is box office. I love Neo. Let, let's let's do it. And so I said, oh, well, I mean, probably you want my candid opinion. They're good uh, for sure. They're very hit and miss. They're very, you know, they're 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 a streaky team, and they notoriously are fucking, you know, argumentative with each other. They will swap IGLs. 
a lot of the guys in the team don't like how much light of the limelight Pasha gets because Pasha's the fan favorite, but they think he's actually one of the worst players in the lineup. They argue all the time. It can get very heated. So a lot of problems there. A lot of problems that you need to. I don't give a fuck. I, I got to. I've got to have them. And I said, all right, let's fucking do it then. He'd already talked to Scoot. He'd already talked to Thorin. And I think they'd probably said similar things. But anyway, I said, look, let's do it then. I know Taz and O'Neill, you know, let's fucking set this up, man. So I think the next night after the games at Gfinity, I said like, oh yeah, Taz, do you want to come? You know, and they were like, oh yeah, yeah, we, we fucking love, love to meet Hastro. Hastro, and we're all sat there. And I'm there and Hastro's there and <laughs> Virtus Pro's there. And Hastro's basically saying, like, to them, like, oh, you know, look, listen, the thing about our org is what we can give you at Envious. It's not just about money. It's about our reach. If you look at our social medias, they're huge. You know, we got, like, loads of fans from all over the world, really engaged American fan base. Uh, it's going to expose you to the, you know, fans. You're never going to get anywhere else. And Call of Duty fans are, are unique. You might not know in CS, but they will follow everything you fucking do. So you, we, we will put a content team on you. We'll make documentaries. You'll have your own YouTube channels. You'll have your own socials. They're going to blow up. It's going to be massive. And blah, blah, blah. And he was like, that, you know, my, I see you guys, you know, very much at the center of what we're doing at Envious. And we're going to put you in the spotlight and all that stuff. And so it was a great pitch. Type of pitch any player would have gone for, right? And so anyway, fucking Taz gets up and just says, you don't want us. <laughs> He says, you don't want us. And he, uh, Hastro goes, what do you mean? And he went, you don't want, you don't want any of this. And, he, and he's going, no, I do. I really, really do. I really, really do. I really want to hire you. And like, I, I don't even know if Taz has had a lot of beers, but he's going, no, 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 no. To hire, he, he literally said to his face, he goes, to hire us, you must be a retard. <laughs> That's what he said. That was his quote. And um, Hastro, this is, this is a, a fucking pitch, right? For, for their work right that's literally what taz said to his face he's a this is why you gotta love this guy that's literally what he said and um hastro's like just shocked you know <laughs> like just like what is happening here and he said he said what i said taz is going we fight all the time bialy and snacks and you you know like bialy's fucking crazy me and him, we're like an old married couple. We don't even know. We never know what's going to happen at a tournament. And, you know, we want... And, and then he said, look, also, we come on board with an org like you. We're going to want everything to be perfect. We've been fucked over by orgs time and time again. No, 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 no. This can't work. <laughs> this can't work. And so Astro's like, well, I, I mean, I, I guess we could, like, do another meeting sometime like just think it over and taz is like oh sure 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 think it over think it over you know thanks for beer good time you know and so fucking anyway meeting ends and me and me and fucking hastro uh, 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 talking at the bar again and he goes what the fuck was that <laughs> And I'm going, I told you. I said, they're not like anyone you're going to meet. Like, like you you, you thought they were going to eat out the palm of your hand. Like, you don't understand. They are, like, the most unique cats in, in, in the fucking world, you know? Like, and I said, listen, who do you like second? <laughs> and he said, I don't know. He said, that French team are good. And I was like, yeah. And he went, you know, but, like, I'm worried about, like, language issues. I don't know if we can do content with them. And I said, look, I'm going to be real with you. If you want to win trophies, go with the French. If you want a fucking drama and a documentary series, you go with the Poles. And anyway, he said, listen, thanks, Rich. You've been very, very helpful. Then he totally ignored my advice. <laughs> <laughs> and continue to try and seduce the balls despite the fact of what he what they said to his face and uh anyway in the end he settled on he settled on the french uh players but definitely not what he wanted right 
Definitely not. That was that classic thing that used to drive me up the wall. People would come from far and wide to speak to the Oracle, Richard Lewis. So I'd love to get your fucking opinion about this. Well, here's my opinion. Well, thanks very much for that opinion, but fuck your opinion. And I'm just going to completely ignore it. Actually, what I wanted was validation for my opinion. And I fucking hate that. And I just don't do that now. Like, I'm just never going to do that again. But anyway, so that's how that's the story of how envious one of major basically. Because <laughs> Taz said to Astro, you must be our word. I'll only say it once on a Twitch stream to to want to hire us. And just a crazy fucking piece of CS history. So anyway, envious. They were great here. This obviously is the Apex uh Kenny with Happy MBK Kiyoshima. This they didn't really do anything after this after they won the major really it was all downhill from there but it, the the madness of Cluj doesn't end there you know this you know this story uh after the major was won i'm just include this for fucking completion sake we used to have a thing where on btn we used to have some we used to have two running bits about kiyoshima one is that he looks like a horse which is sort of true he sort of does and obviously, I think, yeah, by now as well. Oh, no, there was three things about Kiyoshima. There was he looks like a horse, and when everyone was getting vac banned for cheating, the vacaning, as it was called, in 2014, he transferred all of his skins off his account uh, to another account, which he explained to me, because he'd been in the house with those players, he was worried it would be like an IP ban and everyone would get vacked. That's what he said, and I said, that's not how that works. Uh, but anyway, that's that was the way that was explained. Anyway, then the third thing we had about Kiyoshima was that he was shit. <laughs> <laughs> and he's won a major, right? So imagine it. Imagine we've been banging on him and saying he's dog shit all this time, and he fucking is like, I've just won a major. So remember, we're all in this hotel in the middle of nowhere, in the Soviet, in the post-Soviet era wasteland hotel, there's like Disco Elysium. We're in that hotel, <laughs> and obviously all the players are there. Valve are there. Valve stayed in that hotel. God bless them. We're there. The fucking Dream Act management's there, and it's the last night. Major's been won. We've all made it. We've got through. I mean, I'm going to tell another story in a second about Collusion of Pork. It's the most ridiculous fucking major of all time, actually. Uh, I nearly forgot about the fire. But anyway, we do this fucking event, and uh, we get to the end. Kiyoshima's won. So he's fucking wasted. He's in the fucking... He's in there with that... With, not Malek. There was someone else he was in there with. Whoever the coach was. But anyway, he was there with the coach. And he was drinking. It might have been next. Yeah, that might be a good shout. He's fucking shit-faced. He is shit-faced. And me and Thorin and the guys are just sat having a bit. And Kiyoshima comes over and sits down at the table. Like, doesn't say hi or anything. Just sits down, drunk, like plops like like a dollop of shit just dropping out of a fucking loose rectum just absolutely wasted drunk and so he, ah here we fucking go one of the things that always happens at events because we had a podcast was the players who we call shit in the podcast get one or two beers in them and they want to come up and talk about our opinions on the podcast but unfortunately for them the last thing anybody wants to do after a fucking full day's work in CS, is talk about fucking CS. I want to shoot the shit. I want to fucking unwind. want to decompress. But players, they live that shit. So, pfft, major winner Kiyoshima sits down, right? And by the way, this is all cool to tell. I've told it before, and me and Kiyoshima are totally cool de la, right? It's not a problem. He's a good guy we've all kissed and made up many, many years ago, and uh, I wish him well. So anyway... He just goes like, do you... <laughs> why, why is he Russian? I'm just not going to do accents. Let's just not do accents. He said, do you remember when you said that Shox was a better player than me? That's what he said. Do you remember when you said Shox was a better player than me? And I've just gone, he is though, isn't he? <laughs> he is. Well, who's won a fucking major now? And I'm going, yeah, congrats on your major. I'm very happy for you. Shox is still a better individual player than you though. No, 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 no. You don't understand. You don't understand. He is cancer. Shox is cancer as teammate. He is a cancer teammate. 
terrible to play with wants everything cancer doesn't do anything for the team cancer teammate oh, okay right yeah yeah well he might be a bad teammate but he's still a better player than you isn't he though so it's been real <laughs> right no no how, how can you say this there is more to this game than clicking heads more more he's banging on the table more to clicking heads more <laughs> he is cancer teammate he needs Teammates, you need to do things for your team. I do these things. I am better than Shocks because I do these things. And I'm going, well, okay, all due respect. Uh, it's very good that you do do those things, and it's cool that you've won a major. Uh, but uh, I just think Shocks is a better player, and I guess we'll agree to disagree. No, 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 no. He's fucking still going. And then, so I, I just turned to the rest of the guys, and I start ignoring him. And he's still sat there staring at me, trying to get into the conversation, you know, like, wants to keep going. And I go to him and I say, oh, look, mate, come on. I, are you not bored of this now? Like, And he starts doing this. He starts doing his hands like this and going, me no speaky englando. He just keeps saying that over and over again. I'm like, I don't even know what this is. I don't even know what this is morphed into. Me no speaky englando. I'm like, oh, cool. Uh... I'm sure you can understand what I'm saying. It's just, I don't know. I just don't really want to talk about it. Is all right? Now, by now, you know, my hackles are rising because, you know, you might you might have heard. I don't think I've got a temper, but I've got a fucking threshold, right? That's what I call it. And as certain people find out, my threshold can turn into a stranglehold real fucking quick when it's tested. So... I fucking basically said to him, I said, look, mate, please, I'm asking you, could you just leave uh, so we can talk and hang out and have a good time, right? And he's and he sat there now, just staring at me, occasionally saying me no speaky in Glando. And I've gone, right, okay, I'm going to make a deal with you here, right? And I get, I get my phone out and I put, and I, and I say, I'm going to put a four minute timer on this phone. And if you are not gone, by the time, from this table, by the time that hits zero, I am going to make you move. No joke, 100% genuine. You have four minutes to get the fuck out my face. <laughs> and I just put it on the table, set it off, and I'm just sat there, like, because I'm thinking, right, uh, you know, this is the classic, the drunk that fucking won't back down archetype, isn't it? So I'm just sat there, right? Like, and Thorin's laughing his head off. Thorin's like here, and he's laughing. He thinks this is hilarious, right? And fucking the rest of the people are nervous. They they don't find it as hilarious. Duncan's laughing, going, "You better move, mate. He's serious. You better move, for fuck's sake, Keo. You better move. Me no speaky in Glando." And I'm just going three thirty. Three, two, thirty. I'm just counting it down like every thirty seconds, just saying it to him, right? Like, just think I'm just gonna fucking look. Cause you also have to understand, it's not just key or me no speaking in Glando. It's fucking. It's the event. It's the stress. It's the nightmare of no bottle water for four days, no sleep for two weeks. Fucking get the fuck out my industry. Everyone's arguing. You're having a you know, stop the dam from breaking. I'd also had the meeting with Valve at this event. I had the meeting with Valve where I, I said, can we not put a time limit on fucking the IBE power ban? Like, I'd feel a lot better. Told them the story about swag. And they basically turned around and said to me, how dare you make us feel bad? They, that was it. That was exactly what they said. How dare you make us feel bad for banning those players? <laughs> Cheers. So it's all of that. It's all of that. And now Keo's being a cunt. So two minutes, one minute 30. And then Duncan gets up and just says, like, just puts his arm on Keo going, come on, mate, for fuck's sake. Well, I'll, go, I'll get you a drink. I'll get you a drink. And just gently lifts him up. And then next, the other guy is, like, going over there. And I was just, and it's just like, you know, you've just won a major. It's the pinnacle of your career. And you want to sit down and talk to some old fart about something he said on a fucking podcast. And potentially get into a fist fight over it. Wasted out your mind. Go pop some corks, for fuck's sake. And yes, I am aware that Duncan diffusing the situation is the most unbelievable aspect of the story. But it's all real. Also, the other thing with Cluj was there was a fatal fire while we were in Cluj. And uh, anyway, there was, there, was a, there was a fatal fire, a really bad one. It, it was like a nightclub. 
uh, I think it was in Bucharest, and there was a nightclub, and, and what it, it was one of those nightclubs where you know, ah, we've we've just locked the fire escape and we've closed all the windows so we can have like permanent darkness and party for like twenty four hours. It's the collective nightclub fire. Here it is, right? The collective nightclub fire was a deadly fire in Bucharest, which killed sixty four people and injured one hundred and forty six. It was horrendous. It was horrific. Uh, I mean, because they were trapped in there. <laughs> there was only one way out. Everyone's panicking. It's a jumping fucking nightclub. It was. It, it was. It was bad. Sixty-four people burnt to death. It was a national day of mourning when we were doing the major. <laughs> no crowd <laughs> turning up. You know what I mean? It was like for fuck's sake. So anyway, we got hit with. What do we do, you know? Like, do we do we address this? Do we talk about this? And Paul being Paul, Red Eye, <laughs> he goes, guys, uh, you know, it's going to be an elephant in the bloody room, isn't it? We're going to have to show some respect to the Romanian people. And, um, you know, uh, it's my job as stage host, I guess, to, to deliver the message and let everybody know that our thoughts and prayers are with them. So, okay. We're, we're talking about the deadly fire on an esports event, I guess. Fine. So, here's the problem. Because <laughs> it's esports, man. We've set up a fucking stage with a pyrotechnic show. Every time the bomb goes off, it shoots fire into the fucking air, right? Go watch the footage. <laughs> so... On the day of, 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 like, after the fire and fucking Paul gets up and gives a really good speech, actually. Paul, man, he fucking nails it. He's a pro. N can't throw anything at him. That's going to fucking shake him off his game. On his worst day, he's one of the best stage hosts to ever fucking be anywhere near Counter-Strike, uh, to be anywhere near eSports. He's a fucking, he's a godhead performer, you know. So he got up, he really nailed it. The tone, the tenor, the pace... The words, we had a moment silence. And then the problem is in that he, he goes, Now let's play some Counter Strike and he gets off the stage. And within like fucking thirty seconds of the National Day of Mourning for the dead was shooting like this this fucking pyrotechnic display. I can't even tell you how bad it was, right? So there the state right, I must be like 100 200 meters from the stage every time the bomb went off i could feel heat on my face i am i am literally like the stage is behind all of the it, it made it was like 40 foot of flame i remember because it was silvio from pgl and remember pgl were doing the production for this and fucking Silvio came in and was like, oh, good to see you, friend. We have a great pyrotechnic show for this. Come, come, i show you. We do a rehearsal. I went in and I was like stood. I was stood where people are going to be sat. And it went off and I nearly shit myself in fear. I couldn't fucking believe it. I was like, this can't be fucking safe. It was so warm. It was so warm, like, uh, and loud. And he's just stood there like, this fucking great. This is fucking brilliant. I'm like, fucking hell, mate. You could have given me a fucking warning. So on the National Day of Mourning, because 64 people have died, and I said, can we turn the pyrotechnics off? It's a bit fucking, in I said this. It's a bit insensitive, isn't it? Oh, no, no, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> It's fucking fine. Spoiler, was not fine. Uh, was warm. So anyway, Cluj was... Uh, it, it, it was the worst event I ever worked, but I always look back on it with a fondness. I feel it was like a challenge, and it was a challenge that we all collectively overcame. I think the talent hiring was brilliant. I think the broadcast was brilliant. I think the games were brilliant. I think the emergent storylines were brilliant. For me, it's an S tier major, which just goes to show somehow the sausage... Uh, gets made in in a way, and the sausage is delicious and tasty, even though it's all arseholes and testicles. So, first S tier, Clusion of Poker for me. I don't know if people agree or disagree. Uh, I'm probably missing out a ton of mad stories as well. There's like, there's so much about it. 
But um, I love that major. Uh, that was when I felt like CS had actually arrived. So next up, it is MLG Columbus. Now, this event, I, I fucking love this event. I mean, I really did. And there was so much going on at this event. I mean, again, like just a million super cool fucking stories from this event. Uh, this event was the first time I saw Steel. Like Josh came down. It's the first time I'd seen him since the band in person. And there's a really cool photo of us like hugging and like all, you know all still mates. And we had a really good time like hanging out. I got to bring some friends to this event, which you know I never get to do. And MLG, just a super cool company to work for. For those of you who don't know how MLG works, it was like nothing else in esports. Now. Again, because I came up in the old days, I'm second gen in esports. I'm not OG, but I'm second gen. So I got to know all the OGs. And, you know, like MLG as a company did so much for fucking esports in general in terms of normalizing it as a concept. Their Halo stuff is god tier. I remember the first time I thought esports might be a real thing was when I saw the Halo champions on the side of a can of Dr. Pepper. And you're like, Holy fucking shit like that you know i know what that is i know what dr pepper is so it was fucking crazy for them to come into cs and be doing a cs major and getting you know and i'd done sevo and and other you know mlg events obviously and i'm you know good friends with sundance love him dearly and me and I, Adam Apicelli used to be pals, and you know he was he was like a, just a great guy. Again, cut from you know from a time when esports it embraced what it was, and the people were authentic. Like Sundance said a bunch of crazy shit, but he was always real. Robert Olin said a bunch of crazy shit, but he was always real. Adam Apicelli, yeah, every time he fucked up. Every time MLG fucked up, Adam Apicella would come out and publicly own it. He genuinely took on board feedback, and he was real. These were real people. I mean, like, say what you will about, you know, all of those old days. Like, you knew who was running your tournaments. You knew they gave a shit. And you had all these brilliant personalities that were willing to be publicly facing. And now, now what have we got? ESL sends a different pleb, a different peon on Reddit to put a survey thread up after every event and then don't listen to any of the fucking feedback and then sell out to saudi anyway pretty soon you're gonna be getting live propaganda broadcasts from the crown print wicked think about blast who's the guy at blast who's the who's the mouthpiece for that who's the mad genius at blast you don't know do you you don't know it's sad when i think about how great esports used to be and no company sort of embodies that greatness more than MLG and what MLG was before they sold out to Activision Blizzard. And this, at the time, this was easily hands down the best major that they'd been. Easily. It eclipsed everything. And that's crazy because they weren't CS endemic. They didn't come from that background. But they respected the game. They respected the teams. They respected the talent. When you work an MLG event, let me tell you, they used to give you a check on the last day. A fucking personalized check on the last day. In your hand. No waiting for money. No sending an invoice. No bullshit like ESL always do. Oh, we've just changed our invoicing system for the 10th time this year. So you'll have to wait while they rob Peter to pay Paul. You got a fucking check in your hand and a handshake from adam apicella and sundance thank you for working with us we will hire you next time they were kings of how to look after talent after working with dreamhack and doing Cluj, i got out here and it was the first time i'd ever been a little bit cheeky i said can i bring my friend can, can, can maria come can i get a ticket for her and a hotel for her and they said yeah of course, of course whatever you need to be comfortable man you know we love you i was like wow Never had that before in esports. So MLG fucking, you know, they rolled out the red carpet for me. Made me feel like, uh, you know, I was special. Like I, I really was part of something. We knew all of the fucking production staff. The production was literally in a room across from the desk. So, you know, we could interact with them and tell them when we wanted things. They had, they had a really nice look, a really nice sheen. They were just full of great people. Like, really great people. Like, obviously, this was cool because I got to know 
Sapphire through, uh, you know, I, I knew her as a player, but she was an observer by this point, and she was observing at MLG. They had a guy called Kevin as well, who, you know, we had some capers, we had some drinks, you know, he was a fucking great guy. He was the observer for MLG as well. And this crew that they had, it was great. Uh, so you had Red Eye on stage, Scoots on the desk as the host, you had Puckett as the interviewer, and man, like, you want to talk about Hall of Fame fucking talent, to get to work with Puckett was like, listen, I don't fanboy, you know what I mean, because I don't take this shit serious, but like, Puckett is God tier, and if you watched MLG, you knew Puckett, and Puckett is, he should, be, he should never have even you know been in esports really he should be in the nfl he should be in the fucking nba like th this guy is box office he's got the looks he's got the talent he's a sickeningly nice dude and it's genuine I love that man right like and, and 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 so humble and down to earth and really gracious with his feedback uh, a lot of people in this industry they either give you no feedback or they give you feedback where it's kind of like here's what you do you should do and it's you know, sometimes it's unwanted, like, yeah, maybe I don't want to do that, or maybe you're a bit defensive and you go, fuck it. Puckett will always frame it as going, hey, listen, I uh, saw your interview today, uh, listen, uh, yeah, really, really good stuff, I'm loving it, loving what you're doing, I don't know if you want some feedback, uh, but if you do, I'd love to talk about it with you or whatever, you know, you're always doing it in the right way, you know, like, always saying it's there if you want it. And obviously, if you get a chance to learn from one of the greats, you listen. You shut the fuck up and you listen. So, yeah, great guy. I'm so glad. Like, one of the best things we ever did was bring him in at fucking E-League. I was like, please, God. So, every time we went out to these MLG events and Puckett was there, I was just like, you know, hanging out with him and, and just listening and just sort of absorbing and, wa and watching what he does and watching his process. Because I used to be an interviewer as well, you know, like I, I, I could have easily ended up back doing the mic work. But anyway, just having him at the major just gives it a, a just a level of class. And then the analysts, I mean, it's Thorin, it's Moses, it's Fifth Lauren. Yanko has now graduated to becoming one of the top analysts. This is when everyone used to cruelly say resident sleeper, Yanko, resident sleeper, because he was still his accent was still a bit thick and he had a very, you know, not monotone, but it was a very slow pace of speech because he didn't want to trip over his words and obviously he's got loads better people didn't realize like what a wicked sense of humor yanko had and again the average cs fan is a pleb whose opinions are garbage and they don't know anything and they just pick things that go on to become memes that they then treat seriously that's what i hate like resident sleepo started out as like a joke a bit of fun but morons see it being said and think it's real so they repeat it you know they did the same with pansy they did the same as Samler. So anyway, a great analyst. I, I was brought in as an analyst because obviously there wasn't anywhere else for me to go. They wanted to use scoots. They were like, do you want to be a stage host? I said, God, no. Red Eye's got to do that. Do you want to be an interviewer? No. Uh, Puckett is the man. They said, we really want to hire you. Just come and be an analyst then. And I said, oh, well, I had a bad time last time I was an analyst in 2014. They said, don't worry about it. Just just shoot the shit, just give opinions. It's wicked. Then of course it's the it's the trifecta of incredible cast of duos and assembler, Sadakist Henry, DDK, James, uh Bardolf. They also had threat coming in and out. Bjorn worked a ton of events with him, because uh, he used to be face it talent. And I worked an event in Milan with him one time and we did some others. Great guy, love threat. And we had a show director. Will is wicked. We had Alchemist. We had Corey Dunn. It was just fantastic. It was like we went to the Nationwide Arena. What a fucking venue that is. It was fucking great. Right out the gate, MLG, you knew you were getting a special thing. It got knocked out the park in terms of production, in terms of how they looked after everybody. So this was the stark contrast to Collusion of Poker. Then you want to talk about fucking great moments, iconic moments from CS history. They got everything. I mean, you the one thing you can't control when you set up a tournament is the quality of the games. You, you don't know you don't know who's gonna turn up, who's not gonna turn up. You don't know what's gonna happen, you don't know who's gonna be jet lagged, you don't know if there's gonna be a stand in or someone's gonna get food poisoning, all these things. You don't know if you're gonna get server lag, you don't know if you're gonna get production issues. Fucking updates gonna change everything because Valve 
didn't give a fuck and used to update CS two days before the major started. You don't know what's going to happen that's going to impact on the quality of games. It's totally out of your realm. And so when you get great games and great storylines, it's the shit. It's like, thank God. Obviously, there was there was a bit of drama in this one. So you had the splice thing, I believe, at this major. Or no, that was actually at the minor cycle before it when they qualified. But there was like an issue in that minor cycle because used to be, that's how they used to do. It. It used to be majors, minors back then. They uh, basically like they fucked up. They MLG ran a wrong config and they used the they changed the defuse timers and and they used the old one and Splice lost a close round. Like and it looked like uh, the major was on the line and blah blah blah. So there was some drama there coming in. Splice got a nightmare group anyway, my old mate Davey and Professor Chaos and Jason are the greats. They basically uh, got put in a group with FaZe, which was the G2 that had done so well at Cluj, but now with AZ, they got put in with Fnatic, who were not the 2015 Fnatic, but still pretty fucking good, still Fnatic, and Team Liquid, who, of course... A lot of people were talking about how Team Liquid were a sleeper hit, uh, potentially, to win the whole tournament. Why? Because they were already a good team. This is Elige, Hiko, Nitro, Adrian as the IGL, Team Liquid. But it's the one with Simple as a stand-in. And so this is the one where everyone's like, Simple, you know, he's pissed everyone off. You know, Markolov said he was a kid with a lot to learn. Simple's hero mugged him off before this major. And there he is as a ringer for fucking Team Liquid, which gave them an extra dimension on home soil. Na'Vi coming in, I remember distinctly, were meant to be the favourites to win this. Envious had really fallen off and made some changes. You will notice that this Envious in 2016, somebody's missing from the lineup. Oh, where are you, Keo? Me no speaky in Glandor. Turns out, me no have contractor. Yeah, you got fucking kicked for being shit. Fucking cheers. Weird how that works out, right? So anyway, yeah, Envious got rid of Kiyoshima and uh, they had Devil. <laughs> devil instead so i don't know maniac actually was the coach at this event for envious again a lot of people forget he was a coach so yeah you have like everything you want you've got fanatic who have fallen off they're not the all conquering titans anymore fizz much like envious before them have entered into the space a huge org a huge brand you've got navi guardian one of the greats everybody wants guardian to get his major like because guardian is a sweetheart he's a super nice guy Really, really humble. You know, I've known Guardian a long, long time because he was the guy in Counter-Strike Source that everybody said cheated. When that private cheat, Ventrilo.exe, was going around, everyone accused him of using it, even though he was hitting shots that the cheat physically couldn't do. It was just a 64 kilobyte fucking FOV aimbot designed to be snuck in at LAN. And Guardian is humble as fuck, like... I remember one time he had like some fucked up hand injury at like a CSS event and it was the one where the former Birmingham Salvo guys who are now back in Dignitas, like your Wes, your Wilzu, your Rattlesnake, they all were convinced he was cheating because he used to mix them up all the time online, he used to fuck them up and so when he came to this land with a, bro with a fucked up hand, it was all bandaged, his mouse hand they were all like gathering around going oh yeah you, get, you can come with a fake injury have you you come with a fake injury a fucking <laughs> t so when you dog shit because your cheats aren't with you right <laughs> uh you've got an excuse and he fucking mixed them up and fucking knocked them out the tournament and then went over to shake his shake them, their hand with his broken hand he was a fucking legend but the problem was guardian at this event had had a foot an injury he played football apparently which i didn't know and he'd fallen over in the middle of a football game and broke his elbow and he had to have like a surgery on his elbow and it was all bandaged up and fucked up so you've got one of the greatest players carrying this insane injury and what he had to do to compensate for his lack of movement he increased his sensitivity by three times so you have to understand how good Guardian was. With a broken elbow and a cast on his arm, at three times his normal sensitivity, he made it to a major final. Th these are things that stats don't quantify. When I say a cast, it was like bandages. It wasn't like a big old cast, but it was like, you know, he had, he had heavy wrappings around his elbow. It was still fucked. And people really wanted him to do it. I remember that. 
uh, and anyway, they, they get to, I mean, th this, this is the fucking maddest major. Like, this is so crazy. Because I'll tell you what people aren't talking about. They're not talking about Luminosity coming in. I don't care. Anyone who says that they saw Luminosity coming are full of shit. Because I remember distinctly, remember, we, we've gone through the Keyed Stars change. We brought in Cold Zero. I remember when we had, when FNX came in from like 1.6, a guy called Taco joined. Every, and, and Taco, remember, used to get fucking called like... He used to get cussed out for being shit all the time. But he was just a really, really smart and intelligent support player. And Fallen, the, uh, you want to talk about mad geniuses. Fallen, it's not even an eye for talent. Because if, you, if you've got an eye for talent and you pick five... Ta if you're building a team and you've got an eye for talent and you pick four people to play with you based on talent alone, the team itself will likely not be successful. Because talent isn't the full story. You have to understand nuance and like compatibility and role play and how everything fits together. And Fallen, I, I fucking love, I, I love that guy, right? I mean, listen, I know Duncan, who everyone thinks I'm joined at the hip with, uh, my other half, you know, uh, is obviously gone back and forth on this. Is he the most overrated player? I don't agree that he's the most overrated player. I've never said that. Uh, he he may well be an overrated player in the eyes of some because actually, you know, if you look at his prime years, were they that good? And, you know, whatever. But I don't think he's the most overrated. I don't even think he's in the shout for that. Shroud is the most overrated player by a fucking country mile for me. And put it this way, I remember when Fallen, when Luminosity slash SK were just fucking everyone up fallen was one fallen was the next flusher he had you can find him on youtube video after video after video after video after video of fucking people accusing fallen of fucking cheating and remember that gif where it goes whap 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 on cobblestone and everybody was fucking so he must have been good i mean nobody accuses a shit cunt of being a cheat right so he must have been good so the problem was, I think, like, obviously, there was an expectation he would maintain that. But people forget, Fallen had a 1.6 career and a CSS career, right? He came in at the end of CSS and pissed off because you want to talk about Chad shit, right? He, in an interview that got published on, I think, HLTV, he went and played... Uh, a Copenhagen Games, I think in 2010, I was at there. I interviewed him as well at that event. There's a video of me and Young Fallen, Young Rich, Young Fallen together. He said in an interview on HLTV that Counter-Strike Source was more tactical than 1.6. You can't even begin to imagine what the fucking HLTV morons did there were loads of people like because you know you can put like you're a fan of a player you know i love fallen in your thing and on your hltv account loads of people were d-tagging as fallen fans he was dead to a lot of fans well, give a fuck <laughs> he just said it so anyway he had a 1.6 career a css career small one said css was a more tactical game jumped into cs go in a scene that was dead got a sponsorship through leveraging his own brand and personal relationships built up a team that was good enough to get to qualifiers and qualify for major events and then got into luminosity and then obviously had built this fucking team discovered called zero yeah like fuck me dude like like what can't this cunt do right so he's a fucking legend he's an absolute godhead like i mean what do, and and people people did not they didn't fuck with this roster move at all. They didn't think it was good that FNX was back. They didn't rate Taco. Nobody was talking about Luminosity this event. Nobody. I was there, <laughs> right? I remember. Again, only analyzing the playoffs, uh, because what I will say is this game, uh, this ma major rather, probably did have the worst game uh, ever played at a major, which is the flip side mouse sports game. I remember waiting for this game to end it was an elimination match Flipside mouse 31 28 to mouse sports right and if you and you go oh wow that game sounds epic right okay well let me just pull your card on that one it was on cobblestone which was not epic it was on that dog shit cobblestone right and then 
Oh, well, let's have a look at the players involved. Surely that was the good mouse. Sport. No, it was Nico Sports. It was Nico, Chris J, next Dennis and Spinny, right? Oh, yeah, but Flipside had that good. T no, it was Bla Blade was played on that team. It was Blade. It was Bondic. It was Shara. If you had to create an environment for the worst game ever played, you couldn't have done it better. And obviously, Flipside were famously known for doing those, the Blade Executes, which became the meme when he became the coach in Na'Vi. So basically, it was use all the time and then 15 seconds before the round ends, execute on a site. And so that game, I, I'm telling you, I think that game might have lasted two hours for one map. I'm not even kidding. I would love to see how long that game was. Because I remember being sat there in the studio just wanting to fucking end it <laughs> i was like kill me that is garbage so it, it it has the fucking like worst game yeah jace get on that mate stats that griff can edit it in in a cool way like he does i love how griff's coming into the youtube videos now coming in and doing plenty of information he's even got a voice and everything now griff the character of griff has been fully fleshed out no doubt just in time for him to get hired by a big company and then you know i'm back to square one but whatever all right, Editor Griff here, quickly coming in to sabotage my own career. Fuck working for a big company. Also, that match was about two hours and 24 minutes long. All right, back to Richard. Worst game ever played. None of it good, by the way. None of it good. You're going, oh, well, but you know, back and forth. Blah, blah, blah. No, no, none of it good. Go watch that game. You will you will not be able to finish it. It is like cock and ball torture. Like, no fucking way. You, ca you can't tolerate it. In fact, actually, it, it, it's not cock and ball torture. Some people like cock and ball torture. Nobody likes Flipside Mouse Sports at MLG 2016. Nobody. So, yes, this major has the worst game ever played at a major, I think. Uh, but, in general, the quality of games was good. Once we got out the groups, the playoffs are so epic. I remember going into the fucking stadium and just being sat down. We had a wicked vantage point. Where we were sat, the talent, where our green room was, we could literally look down onto the whole stadium. They had that cube, didn't need the fucking cube, like Titan Tron monitors. We could see both stages, all the crowd. The atmosphere was fucking great and you didn't even have to move. You know, it was so good. And you knew you were in for something special. It didn't fully sell out. But it was a very, very good attendance for the time. And so anyway, you get, you know, it's a quite a Na'Vi nip. Bit outclassed. Stralis Fnatic, bit of an outclass. Na'Vi CLG, it's a bit of an outclass. Luminosity beating Virtus Pro was like, oh, hang on. Because now in the semis, you get Na'Vi. You get a Stralis, right? playing you get one banging map there but only one the liquid luminosity game is probably the first time i have ever like when you watch it counter strike and you watch a lot of it you're just watching a game and you go all right yeah this is happening that's happening. that was the first time i couldn't believe what i was seeing i couldn't believe it the jumping up all of it the team liquid luminosity game is the first time i've like just not believed my eyes it was so insane. Everybody was so, like, in on the idea of Team Liquid getting it. You know, the, the Mirage game, 1915, Luminosity, just big in fucking overtime. The the jumping up, okay, whatever. But then you have cash after that. I think, I think the way people remember it, they don't realize that, like, Liquid had another chance and lost in overtime again. It is insane. I couldn't believe. Cold Zero... That was when I was just like, this motherfucker is the best player in the world. Like, it's not even close. Like, this guy just mixed up Team Liquid with still got some juice in the tank. He caught Elige, simple, and he's just fucked them. Like, it, it was crazy. But it, but it wasn't just that, you know, I've talked, I talked on Time Travel Land about this. Everybody on that Luminosity team made it a huge individual play at some point in that series. It was like, wow. And by the way, one of the things I want to say, the fucking crowd, did they boo Luminosity? Did they spit on anyone? Did they have a negative reaction? Nah, I was there. 
Luminosity got a fucking standing ovation. Like, the crowd were fuck. Yeah, they were disappointed Liquid went out. They applauded Liquid off the stage. They applauded Luminosity. They clapped like fuck. Everybody. Everybody just... that. Again, this is what I mean. This is why it's so different now. This is why CS sucks now. Everybody realised they had witnessed something. Like, like a moment. You were never going to see anything like that ever again. Like... You were never going to see a game like that ever again in CS. Never again. I mean it. Like, never again. The game isn't even played like that anymore. The meta is shit right now. The economy is shit right now. You're going to have to wait until CS2, and you're going to have to hope that they let the game be like this, how it was in 2016. You will never see a game like that. That is like the equivalent of, you know, two bangers in the UFC just fucking standing there punching each other everyone giving their all everyone making individual plays everybody doing crazy shit two overtimes on two maps the only way that could have been a better game would have been if it had that third map and it was another overtime like if if liquid had won a map but i'll tell you the crowd played their part in that the crowd was so supportive to Fallen, to the Brazilian players, to Cold Zero, they clapped them off, they gave them a standing ovation. The Liquid guys, by the way, as well, because this is how cool the Liquid guys are, so here's a little thing for you. They they went and sat for the final. They went and they were just chilling out in the stands and watching, like, Luminosity and RV. <laughs> you know, Nitro uh, was up there. I don't I don't know if Simple was. But, uh, yeah, the, the NA players, like, guys like Elise Nitro, they fucking love this game, you know? And they were just chilling, like, uh, watching it. It was just amazing. That that series, I remember, I was up in a, I was up in a ro green room with all the talent, and we were like, it sort of sucks that the NA team has gone out in the NA major. But it is fucking, like, what we've just seen, like, is that ever going to get topped? We and we were just like, is that ever gonna get beat in a major? Is it ever gonna get beat? And then suddenly you have this insane story where it's like it's it's Navi's major to lose. But I'm pretty sure when Navi were like looking at this bracket, they were thinking they were gonna play liquid and they were thinking they were gonna win. And Luminosity were just on some other shit. I mean, keep in mind, okay, so you get to the final. The final Luminosity beat Navi on Mirage in overtime again it happens and something weird happened in in navi at that moment so where i was sat in the analysis booth because i was doing the analysis for the final i was looking down and i saw zeus go fucking crazy over something i don't know what happened in the game or what what was said or whether there was a mistake or i don't know but as soon as the map finished, as soon as they lost overtime, Zeus got up and he fucking tore Flamey apart. Like, I mean, from where I was, I could see him shouting. It wasn't on camera. It didn't go out of the broadcast. He was shouting, screaming, and like, Zeus is a big dude. You know what I mean? Like, big guy. And he stood up and he fucking fuck, fuck fuck like really giving it like like him fucking waving his hands and fucking poking him and all this and flamey's a kid <laughs> and you know he's just a just a fucking you know just a soft kid and he's just there like you know like fucking all timid and all crouched him and zeus is like slammed it out and fucking all of narvi go backstage but flamey doesn't flamey is sat on the stage of a major having lost a close map been cussed out in front of everyone by his IGL, and he's just sat there. I think he was death matching. Just sat there by himself on the stage. One of the one of the like saddest things I've ever seen, actually. Because I think Flamey's a fucking bum now, and I think his attitude stinks. But this was Flamey, who you know, and a lot of people give a lot of credit to Zeus as being a great IGL. And you know, listen, I think he's a meathead. I do think that. I remember when Duncan was kind of like a little bit outraged at the score. Where what was it? The the mo the most brain dead IGL or whatever the fuck. Like maybe that is too far. But he's not a sophisticated thinker, right? He's a fucking he's a moron. He's a fucking moron. Like he actually is though. So what? It, what you know? And also 
not a leader of men. You know, like, not like that. Like, it, it, put it this way. If you want to be a true leader, you got to have different gears because p- people are different. So, you know, not everyone's going to respond to the fucking dressing down. In fact, that's going to make it worse. But he only had that speed. It was his way or no way. And if you fucked up, he just tore your ass apart. Like, he just fucked you up. You know what I mean? Like, that was it. That was how Zeus was. And this is it, all of this eventually... You know, it's, it's it's part of the reason, along with his poor play, is that why he ends up in Gambit for Krakow. But what he did to Flamey was like... I, I can't remember who was on the desk with me at the final. Scoots was there. It must have been Thorin. And we were just looking down, going, have you fucking, are you watching this? And he's going, fucking hell. But it was bad. It was really, really bad. I don't know what... I, 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 I don't know what was said, because obviously it's well, miles away. I can't... And he's talking a foreign language, and I couldn't even lip read. It was so far away. But it was hostile as fuck. It was aggressive and hostile. And so, one of the weirdest moments. The rest of the Na'vi team were backstage in a huddle without Flamey. Think about that. He's just on a stage by himself, deathmatch. So anyway, you go into that second map. And I they'd, they'd given up. Na'vi had just given up. They just couldn't be asked. They'd had a break. And it's overpass. And Fallen is the fucking king of Overpass. It's 16 2. We were sat there expecting like a fucking epic because, you know, it's Narvi, it's their major, it's Luminosity, they've come from nowhere. But we get this 16 2, like damp squib. It goes off. Really weird end to, to, to a major when you contextualize everything. So, again, not a great final. Could have been. Could have been. Should have been one of the greats. Zeus could have composed himself, collected his temper, but he couldn't. And we end up with, unfortunately, a very forgettable second map. A complete blowout. Other things to recall from this event. We did the All-Star North America versus All-Star Europe. This show match, in remember, was showing off. Uh, they brought Nuke back. Nuke had been reworked, and so we were told, and this is the funny part, we were, t- uh, me, right, Adam Apicella comes up into the green room and says, we're doing the show match, who wants to cast it? And I'm, I'm just not even paying attention, because I'm like, not a caster, right? And uh, Adam goes, what we think would be a good idea is if you two do it, and it's me and Duncan, and you, you know, you do it like by the numbers, I'm like, what the fuck? He's like, yeah, you know, you just have some fun with it. It's a new map, you know, blah, blah, blah. Players are going to be fucking around. So you two, you two do it. And I went, all right, I guess. I don't mind. Don't, don't mind. Uh, so anyway, that idea is percolating. And then, <laughs> forgive me, Paul. I'm sorry, man. I'm probably making you look like a cunt here, but like it is. Paul's gone. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh God! Right, Paul's gone. Oh, when I want him in, uh, you know, I'm, obviously don't get a cast much. Then what? Would, would be nice to do a cast. And I went, oh, you can have my spot then. You and Duncan can go and do it. Uh, it's fine. Like, I don't. I don't want to be a caster, you know. And <laughs> and then Paul goes, oh, I'm on. I wouldn't want to tread on your toes. And after, he said, after fucking stamping all over my tootsies. And I said, like, you know, like, no, nah, it's fine. I don't give a fuck. I don't, I don't need it. It's fine. I'm doing the final. It's all good, you know. Anyway, Adam is like, no, no, no. We really wanted it to be BT, like, by the numbers. We really wanted it to be Rich and Duncan. They're the, you know, they got the rapport. They got the edge. We want a bit of fun. I don't know why, by the way, Adam, Adam was encouraging the edge. Because, obviously, I think this was this major with the fucking... Tweet at it, wasn't it, with the luminosity joke and yeah. So, but he said, "We know we want the edge, so you know we want you guys to. We definitely want Rich and Duncan in there." And so Adam came to us and said, "Do you want to look compromise? You know, because Paul wants to do it. Do you want to do a tri cast?" And I was going a fucking tri cast, a tri cast with me, Thorin, and Red Eye. Yeah? I'm like, are you fucking dizzy, blood? What are you talking about? A tri cast is the hardest cast of all, a master. Like, it's the fucking, it's the nightmare. And uh, he went, well, you know, look, don't make me tell fucking 
don't make me say no to Paul. And I go, ah, oh, for fuck's sake. Esports, will it ever end? Will this fucking nightmare ever end? So we fucking do a TriCast. It's Paul. It's Thorin. It's me, somehow, on you. I'm just like, I don't want to do this. But, so I'm trying. Paul's treating it like a cast. I'm treating it like a podcast. Duncan is treating it like Bernard Manning tribute night at the fucking improv. It's a fucking nightmare. I I have watched that VOD once. I like I got made to sort of somebody wanted to watch it with me. And I couldn't fucking I cringed. I I, I struggle with cringe. I have a real hard time with cringe. Uh so <laughs> esports great choice of industry, Richard. But I fucking I can't when there's cringe like the office and I'm about there and that's okay. But when you start getting into real life cringe I can't handle it. I, I, it's got to go off. It, it, whatever I'm watching, nah, can't be around it. Can't. Don't. So, anyway, Duncan is just saying the most ridiculous stuff. What was it? I, I go, oh, I, I think the map's a bit more T-sided now. Whole world is rich. <laughs> like, for, for, and I and I'm just like, I'm just locked in. It's like Rorschach. I'm just locked in there with him. I can't... Anything he says is on me as well, right? So that was just mental. That was a mental thing to say, right? That And that's the least of it. There was a close in on, like, Hiko's wallet. He made some fucking mad joke about that. It was ridiculous. And, of course, Red Eye wants to roll back the years. He wants... He's Mick Hucknall in Simply Red, isn't he? All in bed the years. He he wants to do a cast, but there's, there's no one to bounce off. Like Duncan wanted to bring BTN energy. I just that didn't even want to. It was it was I I was ashamed of that because I just went into every time Duncan made a jo an in joke. I think I'd just say reference game on point. I think that's it. I think that's my contribution to the whole thing. I think I say reference game on point fifteen times and then it's over. I think that is it. So, because that was the saying on BTN at the time. So I went out. I, I apologized. <laughs> After, <laughs> I actually apologized. I went up to Adam and I was going, I'm so sorry about that. Like, that was just shit. That was just garbage. He was like, no, it's fine. Like, no, it's fine. Great. great. I was like, it's not great. Not great. I'm sure with Red Eye, it was like, I'm bloody unprofessional. I'm trying to. There I am trying to bloody do a bloody cast. And so anyway, yeah, it was, it was, I, I'm ashamed of that. <laughs> like, I'm actually ashamed. I'm ashamed of that contribution. I could never watch it again. I think it's awful. I think it's a shame because the MLG did a really good, like, show matches were trash after this, I think. I don't think there was many good show matches because this is what a show match is meant to be. They actually got the players. Like, look at the players they had in this. Like, in NA, they had Hiko, Simple, Tarek, Skadoodle, Shroud. And in Europe, Get Right, Kenny S, Rain, Makaleli, Nico. And they were showcasing a map. And, you know, it, it it wasn't a great game, but it was 22-19. People were trying a little bit. And it was, it was you know, they're big players now. You watch an all-star game, a show match, and it's like, and we've got, and they pulled, like, we got that guy from the Australian team. And, oh, fuck's sake. Banks is having a play. Like, oh, fuck you. <laughs> Please. Please. Like, you know what I mean? Like, a show match is meant to be, is the, you know, do it like an all-star, boom, boom. So they fucking nailed it, but we, I, I'm ashamed of that cast. Like, I'm not even joking when I say that. I'm actually ashamed to have been that bad. And and, and, I'm, and that was why it was important I made up for it in, in Boston. I got to do it with Henry. We'd cast it before. I used to be a caster, caster with Henry. And we, I thought that was a good one. I thought that was a good one. I thought that was funny. In Boston, we made jokes. We had fun. Me and Henry had the old energy back together again. You could tell we had that chemistry. Uh, you know, we could have been a cast of duo, you know, in a, in a different life, in a different timeline. So, you know, that one was was the apology. 
because <laughs> because the MLG one is fucking atrocious. Uh, it really is bad, and it's weird. People fucking remember it fondly. They remember that cast fondly. I oh, remember when you and Duncan cast on that emoji. Hilarious. Remember when Duncan said that thing about the world being full of terrorists? Wasn't that fucking funny? And I'm just, oh, stop bringing this up. Like, fuck, this is this is painful for me. So yeah, it's uh, yeah. People fucking love that for some reason, and I think it's absolute garbage. I think it's. I think. I think it was hands down the worst thing in this entire. This show was immaculate up until that. <laughs> we ruined. I, 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 I won't say we because I don't know how Duncan feels about it. Cause we never talked about it, and I don't know how Red Eye feels about it. But I'm sure he feels bad about it because it wasn't what it was meant to be. And I just, I, I fucking think it almost, it almost ruined the major. <laughs> like that's how bad I think it is. But anyway, so that's the broadcast. That's the games. Let me see if there's any more anecdotes there was nearly a mutiny up in the green room green room tales with richard lewis richard you're talking about the green room that's sacrosanct no don't worry this is fine this affects me there was nearly a mutiny because there'd been a miscommunication because on one of the nights probably the fucking flip side mouse sports game where we had one map take two and a half hours we ended up basically i was the host so you know the rules everybody knows the rules you're in first you're out last. Fuck your life. Casters come and go. Analysts come and go. Everyone gets to come and go, but you're the host. So you're in first and you're out last. So anyway, we did this insane day where it was like fucking 14, 15 hours. And keep in mind, you know, I'm fucking, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a young man, you know, back, back then. And I'm like fucking flagging, you know, I'm like, God, I'm fucking exhausted. And the day kept going and going and going and going. And so it got to the end. Uh, it got to, like, the last game. And I said, Adam, mate, if I fucking close out the show, I go home. If I fell asleep immediately, I get four hours, and then I have to be in for the fucking 8 a.m. call time. I said, please, brother, can I just, like, do one? And Puckett said, ah. Oh, I'll close out for you. Fucking puck it, right? The fucking God. He just come in and say, I'll, I'll close out the show. I'll close out the show. Don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah, a bit of desk work. I've done it. It's fine. You go. Get some rest. Get some rest. Puck it gives me a big hug. Go get some rest, man. Be fresh. You're killing it. Like just fucking, oh, you just, you smell so good, puck it, and you're like a warm blanket. I want to live here forever. Just like a fucking, just a great guy, you know? So anyway, I, I said, is that all right with you, Adam? You don't mind if Puckett closes the show? And Adam goes, of course not. Yeah, yeah, do you think? G get some rest. Yeah, yeah. Right. See you later, boys. So I think like me and Thorin left because Thorin was on for the last death segment as well. Anyway, so we get, in the, we get in the coach, you know, and we fucking get back to the hotel, go to bed, come in the next day, bit of a weird atmosphere. What's happened here? <laughs> people looking at me funny. From the talent, you know, all people I know, all my mates. What? Um... Anyway, mum, well, fuck it, probably, I don't know, smell or something, whatever. So we fucking doing the show. We're in the green room. Everyone's in factions. <laughs> Everyone's broken away. Cast the duo over here. Cast the duo over here. Analysts in the back. I'm like sat by myself. Sat with Maria, sat with Duncan. You know, what the fuck's going on? What's happened here? Like, anyway, fucking someone, and I know who, but doesn't need to be part of the story, had for some reason assumed I'd walked off the set. I don't know why, but because I asked permission to go home early and got sent early and Bucket closed out the show, they assumed that I had stormed off the broadcast and they told all the other talent that I did that that I'd had a diva moment and refused to close out the show. And everyone was like, well, Richard of all people. <laughs> so, and and Thorin implicated as well. People, Thorin had, because he came on the bus with me. So everybody thinks I've had like a diva tantrum and stormed off and hurt the broadcast. I'm not really picking up on it. I only found out when. I said something, and Semler said, well, you don't even give a fuck about the show anyway. And I went, what? Uh, you fucking, you know, walking out 
threatening to not close out the show. I went, what? I got sent. I got what? I got sent home. Blood. What are you talking about? Anyway, so I, I pulled him to one side and I said, mate, what are you even worried about this for? Even if I'd done that, even if I'd been a cum, what are you shouting at me for? Like for fuck's sake! I said, well, I didn't. It's all made up. And then anyway, Adam had to come out and fucking tell everybody. No, Richie didn't do it. I sent him home. He'd done like 16 hours. He was fucking dying on his ass. Pocket had done half a day. He said he closed out the show. Richie went home and got some sleep. And it was just weird. And then after that, I was like hurt feelings. You know, I was like, fuck you. Like, you cunts. As if I do that. Put it this way. There's one thing you'll never get on me. You will, you will, you can interview a fucking million people about what it's like to work with Richard Lewis. And you'll hear different stories. He talks too much. He's a drunk. He's this, he's that. You know, whatever. But the one thing you'll never get on me is that he was a fucking diva and that he shouted it like he didn't work with the crew or he fucking refused to do something for the show. The only thing I've ever refused to do in my entire fucking history of esports is do you remember what was that challenge the mannequin challenge remember that where everyone has to stand still and they were doing like zoom zoom around with that song in the background right you remember that you remember that mannequin challenge remember that well e-league did an episode when the mannequin challenge was big and topical e-league did a fucking mannequin challenge and they got everyone out all the talent the crew the backstage the director the fucking producer and it was it was going to open the show and it was going to end on a shot of the desk of me like you know and i said i'm not i'm not doing a tiktok challenge i'm not i'm sorry i'm not doing i'm I'm not doing it i'm not doing the harlem shake i'm not i'm just not and they and they and, and, and they made me dab. I mean, for fuck's sake! Like, how how much do you want to degrade a man? We've got a fuck. There's a genuine thought with me doing a slow old man dab, like the worst dab of all time. So back to Columbus. That pissed me off. <laughs> that pissed. That really pissed me off. So I just stopped. I, I shut down and stopped talking to uh, some people and <laughs> just hung out with the people. I was like, that was that was mental that that happened. And then the other thing, of course, right was this is the event that moses gets his gg motherfuckers from because we got hot mic'd and usually a hot mic is a disaster but gg motherfuckers made moses's career so uh, i'd turned up i was I'd, I'd turned up with a cowboy hat i'd bought when i was on a night out in vegas if you remember he had like a fucking ridiculous cowboy hat on with like eagles around the side and the american flag print on it i bought him that in vegas when i was out on a bender and anyway we were we were like really pushing moses as like you know the american homer because obviously you know america it's an american event and he's an american analyst and i was like listen you should start wearing all this american stuff i'll call you the bald eagle we'll have some fun with it on the fucking desk and blah blah and then we were like talking and he was talking about uh, a potential move right it might have been Hiko. it might have been the remnants of team liquid or something but anyway somebody was meant to be moving to evil geniuses eg right and so we were talking about it just as we got hot mic'd and i said well what you know where do you think he's gonna go next and he said something like well oh, hello eg motherfuckers it was something like that right and he cut in just as he said, EG motherfuckers, right? Because remember, EG were meant to be coming back. They nearly signed the I by Power team. And then people assumed he was saying GG motherfuckers because the game had just ended. And so his his legendary quote isn't even what he said. Classic esports. He said EG motherfuckers, not GG motherfuckers. Anyway, this is going to be the final rating of the stream. We'll do the other half tomorrow. But this event, as it stood, with the games, with the drama, with the storyline, with the Brazilian major, all of that stuff, it was hands down the best major that had been at 2016. It was a game changer. And let me tell you why it's so important. Because honestly... ESL thought they had it nailed. They saw some lackluster efforts from DreamHack. They knew the problems that went on at Cluj and Poker, and they understood it was a talent Herculean effort that got that over the line and made that a fucking event worth 
remembering and, and, and worth watching. So they thought, listen, we've still got it fucking nailed, right? We, we, we've got it locked down. We don't have to worry. There'll always be a clone. There'll always be a Katowice. MLG's first major, MLG had only done CS events for a short period of time. It blew everything out the water. It blew the, the, the stadium, the look, the broadcast, the talent, the polish, the games. And so, unquestionably, Columbus is S tier. It's not just S tier. It's, I almost wish there was like a God tier. And there's only two events in God tier, and it's this and Boston, right? But it is the fucking best. Uh, 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 by 2016, there has been no better major than this. No, not Atlanta. Atlanta might not even make my S. It might not make my S tier. I actually think, unironically, I think for me, you probably have like Boston. I, I still really rate Cluj, obviously. I know no one else puts that S tier. I do. Columbus and then the Cologne. I think Atlanta, people pick it as an S tier event because it's a bit of a hipster pick. I worked it. I love getting the kudos for E-League having two S tier majors in the minds of the average fan. But I don't think Atlanta was an S tier event. I think it had a lot of great stuff. I thought it was like everything E-League did in CS was fucking amazing because people cared everybody everyone on that team gave a shit they weren't jaded esports fucks everybody knew what the opportunity was and everybody wanted to be there and all of the people who were at turner were excited to work on something new and all the people who've been working esports were excited to be at turner because now we're on tv and now the stakes really matter everybody gave their fucking a game for the entirety of e-league so obviously yes it's a contender for S tier in a lot of minds people, but I'm going to just keep it real and, and say that's an A tier event for me. But spoiler for another stream, because I didn't expect this to take four hours, but it's been good. It's good to talk, you know, good to like tell all the old stories and you know get all the once and for all. Tell some new stories, because obviously I know a lot of you have heard fucking, you know, old Richie 2 stories over and over again. But, you know, for me, there's a ton of stuff that I, I just want out there. You know, just just it, it's important that the full story is told in the history of the game. And I think statute of limitations. I don't think anyone's going to get in trouble, or anyone's going to get upset, or anyone's going to get triggered. And also, I sort of, I sort of don't care. <laughs> I sort of don't give a shit anymore. My time in esports is rapidly coming to an end. We're 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 cratering. 